Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Wednesday, August 23rd, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. <coughs> to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the August 23rd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair Hinn, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I'm requesting the removal of item I-1, Presentation Interagency Commissions, from tonight's agenda. Thank you. In accordance with board policy 8314, unanimous consent of the board is required to remove an item from the agenda at the request of the superintendent. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is eight. The motion fails. Item I um, was a presentation on the inner. I'm sorry? The motion failed. However, I'd like to speak to it. Or, Dr. Williams, did you want to speak to it? It, it requires a unanimous vote per board policy 8314. Therefore, the motion failed. However, um, on the advice of the state, um, advised that an IAC presentation prior to the board's vote on our state capital request um, would constitute undue influence on the board. They've advised that that presentation be delayed um, until after the board votes on the state capital request. Who advised that we considered the state capital request before we the have stated, IAC data? The state advised that the IAC presentation be postponed until the board after the board votes on our capital request. Ms. Joes? I move that we uh, remove item I. Is there a second? Second, second. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any discussion? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, in our brief discussion um, of this, of the state capital request, um, there was discussion about asking to understand the funding that we've received in, through the Built to Learn program, which was new this year, as well as the other aspects of county and state funding, and also um, uh, there's extra grants that we've used for HVAC uh, improvements. Um, so I'm wondering when you say the state, was it MSDE itself who is the uh, parent agents if IAC is part of MSDE or was it some other agency in the state? So the board will have the opportunity to hear um, Mr. Donahue's presentation at a later date. I'm not privy to those details. Ms. Rowe? 
Okay, so I just want to make sure before I vote that I actually understand this. So for three years, I've been asking for the state's facility index scores, and we've been told by the state they're not done yet, they're not done yet, they're not done yet. And now we have a presentation that would inform our state budget request, similarly to how my IPASS is, involving information that would determine whether the state would actually fund our request, and the state is telling us we can't have that information because it might pose undue in. Uh, don't we need the information to make an informed decision? So, Ms. Rowe, the information... Who um, did this come the from? The statewide facilities assessment model will not be used until 2027, um, pending changes by the General Assembly to make those funding decisions. Are those facilities index numbers available anywhere? So that would be discussed as part of this presentation. Any other questions or comments, board members, before I call for the roll call vote? Anyone virtually with any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. Mr. McMillian. There was an email constructed sent out, correct? Mm -hmm. From, correct. yes, where the state people said they didn't want to do that. So they addressed the issue when they were invited, Ms. Hen invited them to speak and it was on the agenda. And then they came back and responded that they were not, they didn't want to do the presentation because they were not comfortable considering that it was a 27 date and they might influence things negatively. So I'm not sure the date, but there, there is an email out that addresses why they didn't want to do the presentation. So I think as a duly elected official, Pro. I'm entitled to information to make a decision, whether they want to present or not. Point to voter, Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Scott. Ms. Rowe is not properly recognized by yourself, the chair. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So that um, the information will be provided prior or if that information is um, sought, please um, make a request. The board is not voting on, on this this evening. If that information is, is sought, um, contact information for this contact for the IAC will be provided to the full board. As Mr. McMillian said, the IAC did not feel comfortable presenting um, prior to the board's vote on our state capital request, which is why it's being requested to be removed from the agenda, and Mr. Donahue is not here to present this evening for that reason. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I did just want to clarify, and I believe you just spoke to it, that we are not voting on this, uh, any capital request in this meeting. That is that correct? That is correct. And are there, my understanding this is a work session, so are motions uh, anticipated tonight, or that would also come at the next meeting? If board members wish to make motions tonight, I will entertain those motions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? <coughs> Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? I'm still voting no. Ms. Mack? I'm sorry. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. The revised agenda is approved and the agenda um, stands as modified. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board board meeting agenda date. Okay. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, resignations, and deceased recognition of service. 
Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D1? So I moved Offerman. Do I have a second? Second, Stolesky. Any discussion? <clears throat> Madam Chair, can we uh, vote on the item separately, please? We are voting on D1. Okay, thank you. That's separate. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 through D4? So I move to Offerman. Do I have a second? Second, Stolesky. Any discussion? May I have a, Ms. Causey? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask staff and if the information can come back uh, at a later time, but I did want to understand uh, the timing of when the retirements and resignations were submitted by the employees um, and whether the employees, um, if they had a certificate, if they were in a position that they left despite not being able to use their certificate in the coming school year. Okay, we, so could you we, repeat? We will follow up. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we'll follow up on that, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Thank you, and I would like to vote on D2 and D, D3 separate from D4, if that's okay with the chair. Are you okay with voting on D2 and D3 together, separate from D4? Yes. Did I understand that? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 and D3? So I move to Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there a second? Second, Stolesky. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. <clears throat> McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Hassan? You may. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favors 10. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D4? So I move to Offerman. Is there a second? Second, Stolesky. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval, Senior Operations Supervisor. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. Our appointee is Jeremy W. Cackle as the Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Facilities Maintenance. I believe he is here. Please stand. Uh, <laughs> brings to us over 15 years of service. Previously, he served as the field representative in the Office of Facilities Management, uh, Maintenance. Excuse me. He also served as the Senior HVAC Mechanic in the Office of Facilities Maintenance and prior experience was at the Beeb Henry Albert Company for over 12 years. Congratulations, Mr. Cakel. Yes, congratulations. Our next item is public comment. 
This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a randomly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Billy Burke with CASE. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman, Mrs. Hen, Vice Chairman, Mr. McMillian, Superintendent, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of CASE. I'd like to begin by expressing my appreciation to the administrators, supervisors, teachers, and staff here in BCPS. There is no denying that the last few years have been the hardest years in education since I began 31 years ago. But I want to remind you that what you do is the most important job in the world. I'd like to humbly offer some advice. There will always be haters and critics. Don't let them rent space in your head. Take time this week and every week to remind yourself of your core values. Ask yourself these questions. What do you believe about public education? What do you believe all children deserve? What kind of teacher do you strive to be? Please know that no matter your position, you are a teacher. Once you know what you stand for, the critics no longer matter. Have the courage to do what's right for students with the resources you have. And if you don't have the right resources, demand them. I can help you with that. And when you fall, and you will fall, get up, dust yourself off, and try again. One of the best models for students is to see our mistakes and how we learn and change from them. And when you feel disrespected, remember that what other people think of you is none of your business. Embrace professional development. I know I'm biased about professional development, <laughs> but the only way to meet the new challenges that students face is to keep learning. You have chosen to teach and lead. Have a great year. And when it's tough, have a great day, or teach a great lesson, or have one great conversation, or smile at someone who needs it. I'm so proud of you and have so much respect for you. Surround yourself with other teachers and leaders that uplift you. Your presence and dedication inspire all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Weber with the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. 
Good evening, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Board of Ed members, and Dr. Williams. I'm Leslie Weber, President of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. I'm excited about new committees, board members, and projects we believe will dramatically increase PTA Council's outreach this year. We have new chairs for our Advo Advocacy and Legislation Committee and Curriculum and Instruction Committee, and have created a new Exceptional Students Subcommittee under Curriculum and Instruction. We've expanded our Family School Partnerships Committee to become the Family School and Community Partnerships Committee, which will focus on reaching underserved populations with some innovati innovative approaches. We've also expanded our Diversity and Inclusion Committee to become the Just Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. That was news from our August board meeting. In other summer news, a number of BCPS students were recognized at the national level this year in National PTA's annual Reflections Arts Education Program. We hope more units consider taking part in this amazing program. Students can be recognized at the school, county, state, and national levels. We recently applied for a national PTA grant with an equity focus. We hope to find out soon if we received the grant. Even if we don't, we'll still carry out facets of the plan we proposed. Thanks to Sue Hen from the Office of Family and Community Engagement who sits on our board for her encouragement and support with this. We've been busy attending some big events. The BC BCPS Partnership Fair, the Free State PTA Convention, which had great participation from Baltimore County PTAs, the BCPS Community School Symposium, and BCPS Fest. All events were superb. Our new Family School and Community Partnerships Committee Chair, Ramona Basilio, and I attended the fair and symposium. And Southeast Area, our, our Southeast Area Vice President, Will Fuhr, attended the symposium since he serves on the Community School Steering Committee. PTAs are a big part of family engagement. So many principals and community school facilitators have reached out during, reached out during and after the fair and symposium to talk about starting, restarting, or growing PTAs at their schools. PTA Council has advocated for years for the community school model, which offers a strategic, partnership-based, holistic approach to serving students and their families through schools becoming community hubs. Finally, we're grateful that on July 14th, the first meeting between Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough, Chief of Staff, Ms. Charlie Green, Sue Han, PTA Presidents, and PTA Council took place. It was extremely well received and participa participants indicated an interest in having monthly meetings. This is a big step forward in increased communications and engagement between the school system and PTAs. We're looking forward to an incredible PT PTA year advocating for every child with one voice. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marietta English with NAACP Baltimore County. Welcome. Good evening, Chairman Hahn and Vice Chairman and members of the board and Dr. Williams. My name is Marietta English, and, I chair, and I'm chair of the NAACP Baltimore County AXO program. AXO stands for Afro-Academic Cultural Technological Scientific Olympics. It's a year-long program designed to recruit, stimulate, and encourage high school students to achieve academically and culturally. It has 33 categories that students can compete in. The program begins in September and concludes in April with local competitions. The students compete for gold, silver, and bronze medals, with the gold medal winners going on to compete at the national level. I would like to thank Dr. Williams for his support of the program. This year we had over 40 students to compete, the most ever. I would like to share the winners at the local level with you. In poetry, written gold medal winner was Corinne Branch, a ninth grader. When her poem was heard at the Faculty Appreciation Luncheon at Coppin State University, the president offered her a full four-year scholarship to the university, and she's in the ninth grade. So you can imagine what the rest of them are doing. And draw, it, it deserves an applause. In drawing gold, medal was won by Jada McAlilly, who went on to the national level to win a, a bronze medal in drawing. Silver was won by Devon Awahu and bronze by Adrian Guilty. Filmmaking was silver, silver Imani Powell. Photography, gold was Jada McAlilly, and she again at the national level won a bronze medal. 
Silver was Sidney MacDonnell, and bronze was Megan Newkirk. Painting was Hamani Lewis, silver Adrian Guilty, and bronze Meg Megan Newkirk. Sculpture, Jada Awahu, silver Shade Shaley Lincoln, and bronze Chloe Mac Mac Monroe. Sorry. We were very lucky at the national level because Jada Oahu won gold for her sculpture, and Jada McAlilly won, br again, bronze for photography and drawing. These students came from Carver because Ms. Stephanie Powell worked very hard to make sure the students participated. But we are hoping that there will be an increase this year of the students that will participate. I look forward again to partnering with Baltimore County with our AXO program with more students participating and more winners at the national level. I would also like to invite anyone that would like to support the program as a volunteer to contact me at Mrs. English 925 at gmail.com. Thank you for the opportunity to, sh to share this information. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton with Tabco. Good evening. I don't know how I can follow that one, but. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Where did the summer go? As we have now started another school year, I first want to speak to all the educators. We know last year was a challenge, and there's always angst as we start a new year. Please be sure that while you're planning for your students, trying to juggle the work-home balance and the countless other tasks that educators do every single day, you remember that your own mental, emotional, and physical health are a priority. I know there have been pivots and upheavals and last minute changes and more. I know anxiety is high. I know because I'm hearing from so many of you, and as cliche as it sounds that you can't pour water from an empty vessel, it's true. Take care of you so you will have the ability to do all the other things too. We are here for the students. Focus on the positives they bring to your classroom. Focus on the why you got into teaching. I ask BCPS leadership, Dr. Williams, and the board to please work with the county executive to find a way to honor the tentative agreement we have for our salary compression. I know there is much back and forth happening around the sustainability of the funding over the five-year plan. I implore all the leadership, Baltimore County government and Baltimore County schools, please work with us. Let's come together and find a way to make this work. Our educators have been in limbo long enough about this, and it is one thing, one huge important thing that we can settle, and settle in a way that shows our educators we value them, we want them to come to BCPS, and remain in BCPS. It sends a message to our community that we want our students to have a certified educator providing them instruction. It honors the motion of this board to prioritize the people, and it echoes the BCPS compass that we recruit and retain a qualified, highly effective, and diverse workforce. All the parties have publicly stated they want educators to get this. Having these educators will benefit our students. We all want it. Let's find a way to make it happen soon. Our students can't wait. I look forward to seeing our students and all the staff who work with them and for them next week. We need every single one of you to be there for our students. Thank you all and for all you do, and have a great school year. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. This morning, I spoke at public comment on the state level. I asked what the Maryland State Department of Education plans to do to address the fact 
that BCPS has a rating of needs intervention. Our school system is one of two school systems in the state that has the second lowest rating. We are not providing what our students need, particularly in the area of special education. There are currently students who are owed services in need of revised IEPs to meet their needs, in need of a placement to start school on Monday. Your own staff has, been, has tried to, on multiple attempts to contact the Office of Special Education to address these and other concerns. The Office of Special Education has been silent and continues, in many instances, to remain silent. Your Office of cons I had to, in one instance, contact my county council rep to get a response from the Office of Special Education. Your Office of Constituents and Government Services had to intervene to get answers. This is not acceptable on any level. Your Office of Special Ed provides services to 10% of the students in this county. It is not acceptable for us to not be able to reach them and get a response. I want to know what this board and Dr. Williams intends to do to fix this situation. Because it is not OK for students to not have a place to go when the start of school is on Monday. It is not OK for a student who is four and five years behind to try to attend class and be successful on grade level in gen ed. It is not OK for you to ignore decisions of IEP teams and decide to not give services when the IEP team has decided otherwise. I want to know what the plan is, and I think the parents and students in this county have a right to know what that plan is. Our next speaker is Simone Balegas. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairperson McMillian, and members of the board. My name is Simone Velikas, and I'm a mother of three students who attend BCPS. I want to thank the Board of Education for coming up with a proposal to increase wages for teachers and staff. Making their wages competitive would create retention and bring a higher educational standard to the classroom. Perhaps BCPS can develop a CTE pathway for high schoolers to take courses to prepare them for teaching and incentivize those who stay and teach in the system. In the future, I feel superintendent of BCPS should be a Baltimore County resident with at least 10 years of living in the county, and their school-aged children should be required to attend BCPS schools for the duration that they are superintendent. I also believe that the school administrators and the BOE members should have at least one child attending a BCPS school, and they should receive financial compensation for that choice, whereas if they choose to send a private school, they would not receive that financial compensation. I bring this up because it has come to my attention that many in administration and our teachers in our school district often send their children to private schools, especially for middle and high school. What kind of message does that send to the parents when our own principals or BOE members are not sending their kids to BCPS schools? I believe if a superintendent lived in the community and had children attending the schools, then they would have vested interest and change would have happen. 
Every day one can witness the repercussions of having closed our schools for almost two years as the violence in our schools has increased. We need to use alternative schools for those children who are acting out. There is no equity for the student who is in class behaving while their classmate is wreaking havoc on the class. Perhaps this is why many quality students leave the BCPS system to attend those private schools we speak of. Students need to be held accountable for their bad behavior. If the children do not change their behavior, then the legal guardians must be held accountable for the child's actions. This begins at home. And yes, every child deserves a free and appropriate education, but not at the expense of the other kids who are following the rules. I think if you make the parents accountable for their child's misbehavior, then they will be incentivized to effectively change their child's behavior. I know that there's a lot of community work that can be done here in the county. Something has to change because your current system of restorative justice is not working, and we're coming to these meetings time and time again to tell you this. Where's the equity for the well-behaved student? Well, I can answer that. They apply to private schools and leave the BCPS system. BCPS has an opportunity to make a good name for themselves and improve their image in the community. I live in, we live in an area where attending private schools is part of the culture. Take this opportunity to improve your academics at BCPS. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Brooks. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams, uh, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, members of the school board. <clears throat> My name is Peter Brooks, and I am the acting director of the Hubert V. Simmons Negro League Baseball Museum located in Owings Mills. It's at the community college site, which is also the library site near the Owings Mills subway station. So, you know how students who have positive mentors and role models, students who know the stories of their history and their culture, they tend to be less disruptive, more committed to their education. Well, the Hubert V. Simmons Museum of Negro Leagues Baseball solves that problem for Baltimore County school children. We also emphasize physical fitness through baseball and good sportsmanship to combat childhood obesity and depression. And your support helps us to achieve that mission. So I am here today to say thank you to Dr. Williams and the school board for partnering with our museum. And we pledge our continued support to Baltimore County Public Schools students, teachers, and staff. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for inviting us and for everyone associated, the school board, with Miss Debbie Phelps, a living legend, to participate in the inaugural play ball event and for inviting our museum to attend the Baltimore County Public Schools Partnership Fair, where we met over 200 supporters and partners. And at this fair, Dr. Williams spoke about the successes of the county school system, but also its challenges coming out of the pandemic. School systems around the country need more than ever the support of families, communities, business partners through mentorship programs, hall monitoring, helping in the cafeteria, educational support. And it is extremely important that our students see that the community cares and that we are here to help. We offer your students the shoulders of people like Leon Day, Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, Miss Mamie Peanut Johnson, and of course, Mr. Hubert V. Simmons, for your and our young people to stand on. And so I just wanted to tell you that these community partnerships which you are committed to are making a difference 
in the community. And we hope that you enjoy our museum because it is an example of when the two people came together as one, and it is an American success story. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Foley Sr. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair Hen, Madam, uh, not Madam, but Chairperson McMillian, Dr. Williams, and school board. I am Stephen Bowie, and I represent the Comprehensive Housing Assistance Incorporated. It's a nonprofit organization where we serve Northwest Baltimore through community development and housing. We believe that schools are the hub for the community, and with that, there's an importance that should be put on community partnerships. There should be opportunities that are created. An opportunity like the resource fair that we just had, the first of its kind. And it should not have been the first of its kind because as a former community school coordinator for three years in the city, um, I hosted my own resource fairs and I saw the effect that it had in schools. I really appreciated the fact that the county is adopting the strategy of community schools because it's one that works. I was invited by at least four of the eight schools that I work with to attend the resource fair. And while I was there, there were several resources available for students. As a former city school student, I know the, the, the strength and the power that there is in having resources available to you. Having gone to college and saw that my teammates that had access to resources were stronger than me, faster than me, better than me at positions that I played because I didn't have resources available. Resources are everything. It's imperative that schools have resources for their kids, for their parents, for their teachers, and for their principals. One of the things that we did as a community um, organization is we identified the mindfulness program at Holistic Life Foundation and had them come in during the pandemic and do mindfulness training for some of the students while they were home because they're facing some things that we've never faced before and having to stay home for two years and learn. That can mess a kid's mind up. As a parent of two county school students, I know what it looks like head on. So I appreciate the resource fair and what it was able to bring to the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking solely as an individual. Where do teachers come from? There is no teacher stork. There is no teacher cabbage patch. Sadly, teachers do not spring full-blown from the brow of Zeus. Teachers are grown, and if you ask 30 teachers, you'll hear 30 paths. When I was in high school, I enjoyed learning. I was able to learn things in one room and still remember them and think that they were true when I was in another room. To this day, I think that this is the skill that marks what we call good students. In teacher speak, it is called transfer, when you can apply what you learn in math class to your science quiz and vice versa. Lots of folks think that math is math and science is science. And the fact that we change little tiny words when we change rooms does not help. 
Several of my friends had a hard time in physics, which I was taking at the same time as them. I figured out that most of the time you needed to set things equal to each other or make them sum to make zero, but most certainly you needed the units to work out. I remembered what my geometry teacher had taught me about units and helped my peers to do physics. They bought me pizza and told me that I should be a teacher when I grew up. We were all happy. Baltimore County should be applauded for participating in TAM, the Teacher Academy of Maryland. I would love to think that five years from now, a greater fraction of the seniors in TAM than their peers will complete new educator orientation and will spend this week nervously putting up bulletin boards. Similarly, when honor societies offer tutoring, whether it's after school, during lunch, or during a specified time during the day, this might spark in some students the itch that they will one day scratch by joining our ranks. Now, these are things we do now. TAM hasn't been around long enough to reap rewards, but it has potential. But what can we do over the shorter term? What are the gateway experiences to teaching? I know at least one teacher who was an instructional assistant not two years ago. Taking advantage of the Grow Our Own program, she now works with instructional assistants, but now as a teacher who writes and delivers lessons, is responsible for grades, prep, and communicating with parents. Not every IA wants to become a teacher, and that's fine. I don't want to be an administrator, but it's imperative that we keep this program vital and healthy. When we grow our own, we grow teachers who know what they're getting themselves into. I see that we have a class in the registration system that helps adult assistants to transition into instructional assistants. And I see that that class is full. It will help them to pass the Parapro. They will eventually have increased responsibilities and they will also have health insurance and a pension. Not every AA wants to become an IA and that is fine. Again, I don't want to become an admin, but helping our staff to progress up the lanes may help us to grow our and their capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Darren Badillo. <clears throat> Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. Board of Ed Education members, thank many of you for your service. Uh, your job is the last defense on making sure our children have a quality and safe education. It's not the teachers unions, it's not the county council, and it's not the county executive. The buck stops here. Most of you are leaving and have not run for re-election. Re All of you had many choices to make last year and during the pandemic. To the public, many seemed bad and did not put our children's education and safety first, and I can understand why. Let's have a brief recap from last year. Many children with IEPs and 504s have not received the proper education, and children with disabilities are seen as a problem rather than a child that needs additional services. In the beginning of the year, many fights were documented on the news. It started as small fights, then big fights posted on social media, and then recorded sent to me and other local leaders. Children being violent, disruptive, disrespectful in class, as well as on the school bus, and nothing being done about it. Teachers and bus drivers are frowned upon for speaking up or trying to suspend or write up a student who continues to break the rules. This is important. Equity and social emotional, when you put them together, it equals a poor education, failing community, and no one's held accountable. It's not about black or white, it's about right or wrong. Towards the end of the year, it only got worse. It went from student, students bringing weapons to schools, handguns were found in Baltimore County schools, one child got airlifted for being seriously injured on school property, one child was hit with a baseball bat on school property, and another child was robbed at gunpoint, and another child was pistol whipped during a high school after school event. Let me ask the board this, vaping. How are children allowed to vape on school property? Last year, one child had a seizure to, due to strong marijuana. We hear fentanyl all over the county. We need to fight to protect our children with peer pressure and drugs in school. I'm begging you to do something before somebody loses a child. Can we put ideas in place to hold children and parents accountable? Can we put ideas and plans to protect their children's safety while in school, like, out, like hire an outside security firm or put cameras in school? Can we have a meeting with the students at the beginning of the year school year to discuss what bullying is and what will happen if you bully other students? But most importantly, can we discuss what appropriate touching is and what's not? We need to educate our children on what sexual assault is 
And what steps were taken if it happens to them? We had 200 kids walk out of Dundalk High School because of, sex, because of sexual assaults, and we had 400 children walk out of Patapsco High School. Last year was a mess. I haven't heard of any plans to address these issues, and some of you will never serve the public again. You still have a chance to make a significant difference. Please do something before you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Good evening and blessings to everyone. 46 years ago in 1976, our first child was enrolled in elementary school and the two younger ones followed four and six years later. I had become an active member of the PTA and elected as its president in 1984. The hot topics throughout those 16 years under Dr. Dubell were school vouchers, teachers shortage, minority achievement gap, special education, budgetary approvals, TAPCO, AFSME, leaking roofs, dysfunctional plumbing systems, deteriorating buildings, overcrowding, discipline, and lack of air conditioning and heating systems. Dr. Stuart Berger in 1992 became very controversial and was let go. Dr. Anthony Marcioni was hired in 1995 who departed in 2000. The persistent issues existing since 24 years did not disappear. My children had graduated from high school by that time. I had also become a community leader and heard from parents about the difficulties their children faced and were facing. It reinforced similar narratives of my children during their school years. Dr. Hairston had become the new superintendent. Seismic change in the demographics was taking place. Questions about quality and equity became more evident, in addition to the issues mentioned earlier. I resolved then to never miss an attending meeting of the board, if possible, when permissible, and opine, and also present solutions. Dr. Dance was recruited in 2012 and let go in 2017, and Dr. Valera White served as an interim superintendent. Dr. Williams, you were recruited in 2020. I witnessed the turnover of many board members over the last 46 years. It begs the question whether Dr. Williams alone is responsible or liable for the history of continuous shortcomings in BCPS. Crime and gun violence have been increasing every year throughout the country. Almost a third of the students come from a single parent home, another third have food security. SROs have been patrolling. Capital budget have been lacking to meet all the needs. Many teachers used BCPS as a springboard and moved to other jurisdictions. We have advocated before and today for the board to have power to tax and avoid the restricted funding necessary. The head of any organization, like Dr. Williams, can only produce a quality product if he or she is provided good, healthy resources and good quality resources. In my humble opinion, Dr. Williams is an optimum head who has been performing the best as possible with what limited powers and resources he has been given. And you can compare what all the issues I mentioned before and how many of them have been taken care of. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Bosch Farron. Good evening to all. It's a really special time of the year, and I really thank you all for what you are doing to the school system with the restrictions you have. I have five concerns I want to share with you. Number one, the county executive turned you down twice, and in the second time, he described your action as irresponsible. Isn't that proof enough 
for you to lobby Annapolis to grant you tax levying authority so you can be independent. The community is saying that the buck stops here. It can't stop with you unless you have control on collecting education taxes and spending it. You can't be independent. Number two, racism against blacks, Latinos, Muslims, <coughs> lesbians, and others still occur inside the school and outside. And it really cannot be an issue of white and black. This is almost like termites. It really needs to be dealt with. Number three, there is so much about politics in the school system, politics to advance political ideology, religious ideology, ethnic ideology. If we don't focus on education and leave everything out, the students will lose, no doubt. Number four, the school system is focused on multitasking. I'll give you an example. You are the restaurant that feeds the students in the school, and even well, my time is running out. And, and, and you have busing issues, and you got to focus on education, all right? Always remember GE and GM. GE was doing everything from space to the pot. You need to focus on education. Everything else needs to be somewhere else. Last, honestly, I don't think we learned the lessons of COVID. If we had unrest tomorrow, all right, and our kids cannot go to school, you need virtual learning plan program. I think it's not a priority anymore to the school system based on what I hear and read and talk to people in the education system. I think we should be prepared, whether it's a virus, violence, shortage of teachers, whatever it is. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brent Howard. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Excuse me. Hello, Madam Chairperson and board members. <clears throat> My name is Brent Howard, President of the Baltimore County Chamber of Commerce. The Baltimore County Chamber has fostered a strong partnership with BCPS leadership, creating lines of communication uh, between BCS, BCPS uh, leadership and Baltimore County businesses in general by way of event partnership and general outreach. Superintendent Dr. Williams has spoke multiple times to our membership. His first visit came during his first year, during his tenure, to chart out his vision and his focus for and, his, and the focus of his administration. His subsequent visit, his his subsequent visits provided pivotal updates and an avenue to continually engage BCPS and, and illuminating other opportunities to support the Baltimore County uh, public school system by the business community. I recently attended the BCPS Partnership Fair. It showcased the partnerships BCPS has created with business owners of all, of all shapes and sizes, as well as creating a vehicle to allow additional partnerships to be created with other businesses, and that's something that we took advantage of, and we passed that information on to our membership and they were great uh, wildly enthused by that by that opportunity when I when I attended a partnership on a personal note as a parent of children entering the BCPS system I was encouraged by the number of award-winning teachers and administrators that are under uh, that are currently employed by BCPS it spoke to the type of individuals that are currently employed at BCPS and the support that our that our school that our current parents and teachers are enjoying at this time after a few trying years um, that all public and public school administrators have been dealing with, we stand for continuity and consistency in leadership to continue to support the students and parents moving forward, um, as well as create a healthy business community. The business community is supported by parents and teachers, um, as well as students. If they don't have, if they're not healthy, if they're not set up to be successful, then it has a cascading effect on all of us, and that's something that we've seen over the last um, two years. So we look forward. 
forward to this particular year um, of students going back um, back into the schools as well as the continued partnerships between BCPS as well as the business community to create to continue to create and foster um, partnerships that we think are going to have an impact on our students as well as our community in general. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Jean Milstein. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams and members of the board. Imagine this scenario. You are sitting in an airport terminal, eagerly awaiting your flight home after a week-long vacation. When you hear an announcement, your flight is oversold. You feel an uncomfortable uncertainty as they ask for volunteers to move to a different flight. Monetary compensation is offered. You take stock of your situation. Can you afford a five-hour delay? Sometimes arriving late isn't an option. Family, work, and other obligations prevent it. Other times, arriving home five hours late with airline vouchers during the summer means that you are able to attend your friend's international wedding in France the following winter. An inconvenience becomes an asset. People like to think that they are gaining something rather than losing something. Would you rather fly on the airline that suddenly decides to charge you to check your luggage after years of doing things for free? or the airline that allows you to pay a premium for early boarding. Both are monetary transactions, but one, in one it feels like you are having something taken away. The other feels like you're paying for a perk. The same concept works for a school system as well. One county is offering bonuses for dual certified staff to fill roles in harder to fill areas. Another reassigns teachers two weeks before, the school, before school starts. Which system would you rather work for? Raising competition, uh, compensation rates for providing special education services, paying support staff to cover classes when they know the students and the content, both are examples of using resources wisely and creatively. Let's ask ourselves, are there other ways that we can leverage our large system in creative ways? Can we combine sections of courses and have teachers teaching electives and other classes virtually to students in more than one building? Can we ask for volunteers to go back into the classroom based on factors that allow staff some control over where and how they return? Can we find and encourage support staff who may have been in their roles for years to take the leap to become certified teachers while also filling in blanks in the schedule? As we move forward in yet another unprecedented year, let us hold on to these concepts and more as we support each other. And for the record, I wrote this before the email came out this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Bersades. Good evening. Good evening. Previously, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in the following cases, HE 22-11, HE 22 22-16, 22-26, 22-28, 22-29, 22-30, 22-33, 22-37, 22-37, and 22-38. That would be a appropriate time to confirm the votes taken in closed session. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE 22-11 in which oral argument was held and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Hassan. Second. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Tolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 22-16, 22-26, 22-29, 22-31, 22-32, 22-33, 22-34, 22-35, 22-36, 22-37, 22-38, 22-39, 22-40, 22-41, 22-42, 22-43, 22-44, 22-45, 22
and 22-38 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Roe. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. Millian? Yes. yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Thank you, board members, and please remember to sign the decisions before you leave tonight They're on the table. By thank, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the fiscal year 2023 negotiation teams. For that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Mr. Duke. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. I'm here this evening with Mr. George Duke, Manager of Staff Relations, uh, requesting your approval for proposed FY 2023 negotiating teams. I'll turn it over to Mr. Duke at this time. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board. As Ms. Charlie Green stated this evening, I'm requesting the Board's consideration and approval of the recommendations made for the negotiation teams that will represent the board in the 22-23 negotiation cycle with our collective bargaining units. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2023 negotiation teams as presented in Exhibit H? So moved. So moved, Offerman. Is there a second? Ms. Second. Rowe. Okay. Mr. Offerman with the motion, Ms. Rowe with the second. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? I'm sorry. Student member does not vote. Sorry. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you both. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the proposed fiscal year 2024 state capital budget request. For that, I call on Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Dixit. So good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, good evening. Dr. William, members of the board. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. Today we are here for a work session on a state submission of capital budget for the benefit of new members of the board and a refresher for the veteran member of the board. I have a little bit of background information about what it is and what we are going to be talking about so that we, you have a better understanding. The capital budget is primarily to construct, renovate, improve our building system and learning environment. Operating budget, on the other side, is to maintain, operate, repair, and clean our buildings. So that's a major distinction, and I wanted the new members to know about it. There are two funding sources for the capital budget. One is the state, and the other is county. Uh, in the state of Maryland, it's a joint venture for state and local government to build and renovate buildings. Funds for these are generally predominantly from bonds as compared to uh, regular taxes for, uh, for the operating budget. And there's limit depending on the county's uh, or state's credit worthiness uh, as to how much money can be raised by each entity. All of these budgets must be submitted one, one year in advance to obtain funding before the project can be initiated. Historically, uh, state has given us 40 to $50 million per year, and county has given us 100 to $120 million per year. Two different cycles, 
they complement and support each other, but they are totally two different cycles. For a new person, it appears to be confusing and complex, but as you go into it, as you go through one cycle, you understand how one system supports the other to make it happen. Last year, uh, Built to Learn Act provide another $420 million uh, over a period of 10 years in addition to county <coughs> and state funds. In addition to that, there are time to time grants from state um, uh, for aging schools, uh, for healthy schools, and safety and security program. They are small in amount, but they are very useful, and they have been helpful to us. For a typical project, state portion is 33% uh, uh, and 33 to 60% depending on the project. The county provides 40 to 60, 70% of the project. So major, major share of the funding is county's funding. But state has detailed guidelines about what should be done, when it should be done, and any project, even if they don't fund, but it exceeds $350,000, they monitor, they review, and they approve. So these are some of the things that I thought uh, board should know uh, before we start the work session. Uh, you have three attachments, and I'll be talking about the attachment that is fiscal year 2024 uh, state capital budget request. It should be mentioned in the top left corner, uh, second line of, of, the, of the document in the top left-hand corner. Uh, for those of you who are here, you have the benefit of what was submitted in the past. This is very similar to what we did before. I'll, I'll highlight the difference where we had changed, and it is just additional projects. Again, I remind that this process is about getting the funding so that we can start the project. Lansdowne High School replacement was fully funded in fiscal year 23. Built to Learn Act helped us to fully fund Deer Park Elementary School, Scotts Branch Elementary School, Dundalk High School addition, and Towson High School. When I say they are fully funded, they are based on the best estimate that we have. If there is any additional amount needed later on, we'll work on that with county and state as needed. All of the systemic projects that we had included in, in last year's uh, request, and for the benefit of new board members, systemic projects are projects that are major systems of the building. It could be roof, it could be boilers, it could be air conditioning systems, as compared to major construction and renovation, which entails the entire building. So all of the systemic projects that we included in request and board approved it, they were funded, some with the state and county funds, and some 100% county funds. I do want to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to county authorities, uh, to county executive and their fiscal folks, in supporting our program and especially providing fundings when we do not get a state funding. The following projects that you see, they have been added for in this year's program. Priority six, seven, eight, and nine are for intercom systems. Uh, they are old and obsolete, and they are extremely important for communication with students. They have been added. And I, would, I wouldn't read every project, but you see pr priority 10 through 33 are predominantly mechanical systems upgrade. So there is a lot of emphasis on making sure that mechanical system function. Uh, we have old systems. Uh, they have lived uh, their useful life and probability of failure is exceedingly high. So all of this is comes under the category of 
infrastructure improvement. These systems have priority because they impact classroom environment. Uh, all of these documents in, in all of these projects, in, you will find in some cases there are open space classrooms. So when we take this project, we'll, we'll make sure that those open spaces are closed. We also look at if there is any unair conditioned space in the building. And within the constraints of funds, we take care of those spaces that are not air conditioned. Uh, this document is an evolving document. Uh, the entire uh, capital improvement program submission that, uh, that you are seeing, it requires additional information that the state requires. And the submission is of the size of the old telephone books with, with dozens and dozens and hundreds of forms to comply with the state regulations. This, that entire program has to be submitted in the first week of October. So as you will see in the schedule, there's another attachment there. Um, we have detailed uh, as to when, what step, what action has to be taken place. So just as a reminder, key dates, uh, the, uh, the state submission was introduced to board in the August 8th meeting, which was rescheduled. So we had uh, presented it again on the rescheduled meeting. Today is the work session, which is August 23rd. And in order to meet state deadline of first week of October, we'll require your approval in the next board meeting, which is uh, September 13th. We had asked the board to submit any questions to superintendent, and we have not received any questions indicating that the information we provided was clear enough and did not require uh, any clarification. But if there is any question that you have, I'll try to answer. If I don't have the answer, uh, we'll get back to you later on. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. And I'll get us started with one question, and that's regarding the template for the state request. Is that an internal document or with, within the telephone book? Is this something we submit in the format that the board is reviewing to the state? So the details. Uh, of the program are not reviewed by the state prior to submission, but you get a copy of it. Okay, let me um, be clearer in my question. Okay. The specific state capital request document the, um, that we, the board receives and, and approves, is that document an internal template or is that a state template? And if the board wanted to see additional data points, is that something we could request to see on that? For instance, it would be helpful to see the state funding source, for instance, if it's a built to learn project, if it's an aging schools or healthy schools project, um, to identify that. And is that something that's considered when prioritizing that, whether or not funds are available um, for each particular project? So in your attachment for the it's, it's a good question, so let me see if I can get to my attachment. Uh, if you look at the spreadsheet, let me answer the first part. This format is our own format, and from time to time, board has a added additional request that we provide. For example, farms percentage was an item that board had requested, and we had included that. About the source of funding, if you look at the attachment, there is a number in front of that school, and then there's a footnote indicating what that. So all of the Build to Learn Act project have four in front of them, okay? So four indicates that these projects will not be submitted to state in October because they have already been uh, funded by Build to Learn, and when we submit it to them, we'll take those projects out. Did I answer your question? Mostly, yes. Okay. It would be helpful to know which source of funding um, the remaining projects were to come from because they have different requirements. And the last piece of my question then had to do with um, 
does the funding source, because there are different criteria, right, for which project qualifies for which funding, yeah. is that a factor in your prioritization based on which funding is available in any given year? So if I understand your question right, what board is really approving is the priority of these projects. So as the funds become available, if the Build to Learn Act came to us, you will see that the we follow the same priority that board has approved. Once one, two, three, four, five, whatever is funded by Build to Learn, then there's all one source of fund for state and one source of fund for county. So we keep following that priority that board has approved. We do not change any priority than what we are sharing with you and what you will approve. So once the Build to Learn funding is exhausted, we'll go to state. And state and county is a formula that those forms will indicate the calculation. And if the project is important enough, urgent enough, and state did not fund it, then we request county partners to help us fund that, and in a lot of cases, they do. So in any given year, um, you said we've received 40 to 50 million. That's right. If an additional 40 to 50 million were made available and the cutoff were the projects one through 10 were funded, would we then fund 11 and so forth down the line if, That's right. if additional funds were yes. made? Thank you. We will not change board approved priority. Okay. Other questions, board members? Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Joes. And then I'll. Mr. Dictate. And I'll check the chat. So I see in a lot of these, um, in 10 and below, it says open space improvement. Can you explain what that is? And is that open space money that's being used for the open space improvement? Or is that school system construction program fund? Because I know there's an open space grant. I'm just trying to figure out. OK. Uh, it, it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, a lot of schools that were designed and built in 70s, uh, architect used open floor programs. If you, if you are a teacher or if you have been a teacher, you understand what it was. That was a trend in education where open space was provided, where, where a bunch of classes could be conducted in the same space. Uh, later on, we found that the instruction process uh, or the learning environment is not as conducive, and the architectural trend was uh, not the right thing to do for students. The challenge became that once you have that, it is difficult to update the building. It is not simply a matter of just providing a partition. The building has to be practically redesigned to convert that spaces into individual classroom or as close to individual classrooms as you can get because the lighting system, the mechanical system, the ventilation system all have to be redesigned. There was never funding for that additional work because of the needs. As you know, uh, our needs far exceed the available fund. Uh, $4.7 billion is need, and $2.5 billion is the available funding over the next 15 years. So what we are trying to do uh, with the approval of our superintendent and with the support of our fiscal partners that whenever we get chance to get into a building where some funding is is available for other 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 part of the program for example air conditioning or mechanical system we use that opportunity to redesign the spaces to change open space to to an enclosed space as close as we can get Okay, so this has nothing to do with like the open space grant program that has to do with like parks, no, facilities, no, and exterior land. No, absolutely this is not. the actual whether or not a building was constructed to have open classrooms or individual classrooms. Okay, that's, right. that's helpful because that if you're familiar with all the grant programs, the name is confusing. Um, has the has the county agreed to fund priorities ten through thirty three if the state does not? So county does not take any action till, till board approves it. So we have talked to them. They are aware of our submission, but they have not said yes or no. 
But if you go by the prior experience, they have been extremely supportive of our request. Uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Williams' leadership in that, that whenever his team submits something, he gets total support from uh, county fiscal partners. Okay, and so also my understanding is that the IAC has come up with their facilities conditions index scores, and I wanted to know if any of these items in 10 through 33, if we perform these items in those facilities conditions index scores, show that that school would have been better off to rebuild, will any of these projects, if we do them, prevent the rebuilding of the school in the next 20 years? So uh, let me try to give you a little You understand bit. what I'm asking, Yes, right? I know okay. exactly what you're asking. So um, uh, any assessment that is done is helpful, but nothing beats the knowledge of uh, staff and team inside our own organization. So we have an assessment done by independent consultant that county funded. We have another assessment that state has funded, and there's bound to be some deviation in their assessment. These systems have lived their useful life, regardless of who's assessing it. So if for some reason the condition comes that they do not fund it because their assessment indicates they do, they do not, it doesn't change the fact that the system is ready to fail. So this is not an exact science. It is the best experience. They spend certain number of hours in assessment. We spend 24 hours fixing it when they fail. So really our team, the maintenance team, the design team, and the operating team combined, that institutional knowledge is very valuable to us. Okay, so if we fix, for instance, the mechanical spring system at one of these schools, and then we decide within 20 years based on our information and the state's um, facilities index scoring, which will change the funding qualifications in 2027, that, that we wanted to rebuild this school. Would that mechanical system have to be deducted from the state share because it's been newly replaced? Another very good question. So anytime you have bond money for a project and then you demolish that school, uh, the, on a prorated basis, that amount has to be, uh, we have to reimburse the state for that amount. But keep in mind that the, the average lifetime of that system is 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, state assessment will not start considering projects till 27, fiscal 27. That's three years from now. Yeah. So in, you know, 12 years, yeah. we have to wait 12 years before replacing a building? Yes. So we have been very careful in looking at it that none of these schools are for renovation at this time or in the next five, 10 year horizon. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Joes? You are next in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dixit, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I see that there's a lot of funding for capital CIP infrastructure improvements, and, and that's good to see. OM is important for capital, but for capital facilities, as you know. Um, I also like that you included the farm percentages for the state capital budget request. Uh, can you explain how the priorities that were approved by the board and how BCPS does its assessment as opposed to the state? Uh, assessment for funding? So, uh, good question. Uh, I'll take the last part first. The state's assessment is mainly for the condition of the system. Uh, our evaluation, supported by Baltimore County, which is known as multi year improvement plan for all the school, we looked at three factors the condition of the building, uh, the capacity utilization of the building, and educational adequacy and equity. 
So the system that we have used goes far beyond just the condition of the building. Uh, so we have a lot more trust in what we have, but also we respect the state system because they also fund part of the project. Um, so the priority of the major project is based on consideration of those three factors. And they have been vetted uh, uh, with the board before. Multi-year improvement plan for all schools was presented here. They have been shared with the uh, with the county folks and with our administration. I didn't miss any part of your question, did I? No, you answered it. So thank you. I understand that the state is looking at it at a very high level, so it's looking at condition. That's right. We are down the ground, boots in the ground. So you're looking at it holistically, and I, it's a more wholesome approach. So thank you, and also for putting the farm's percentage. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Good evening, Mr. Pete. Good evening. Let's. I probably need to turn one of these off. Uh, the third attachment, FY23, County Capital Budget Request, and the priority number, number nine, is the Northeast Area, new slash addition slash renovation, and number 10 is the Southeast Area, new slash addition slash renovation. Can you share with, with the public when are you going to release the results of the overcrowding analysis, the Northeast and the Southeast? So as we indicated to you in our response to your question before, we are in the final stages of completing that. The need for that information will be in the county's capital budget when we come to you later on in November, December time period. So it is our hope at this time that th those reports will be completed prior to that. Uh, we have said early fall to you before, and we still hope that we can meet that timeline. Okay, because, the, you know, the public is anxious to hear that, as I am, too. Um, so from little bit that I know uh, uh, is, is, is very supportive of what public had requested in our community meetings. Um, uh, some of the final details are still being worked out, and as we find it, we'll share that with you. Okay, so can you give me an approximate month when you could do this? Uh, if I give you, it will not be accurate information. So that's <laughs> okay, my concern, okay, okay. okay? I'm sorry to nail no, you to the wall. Okay. Thank no, you. I know, uh, and, and we are just as excited and anxious to release it as <laughs> you would like to see it. But we want to have complete document with all accurate information so that we can support it. Uh, our consultant is working very diligently on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as a follow-up, Mr. Dixit, those two projects, the planning have been funded by the county, and that's why those are on the FY23 county that's right. request, you not the FY24 right. state request that we're that's discussing. Right. That's right. So I just wanted to clarify for those no, at home. That, that helps. And, yep. and, and that information, which will come out of those studies, they'll take us further into how much money is needed from county to start design. Right now, we don't know what to design. So we're okay. not requesting anything so, from the state yeah, for those two right. projects as of now. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. Hager? Um, thank you also. Um, I always appreciate your explanations of everything. A refresher is always good. Um, so it, since I've been on the board two and a half years now, we've um, had seen a lot of really ambitious um, building, you know, capital budget requests, and um, which, I, which I think is wonderful. Clearly, there's a great need. Um, so, for example, Lansdowne, you mentioned, is, has been taken off of the list because it's fully funded, but it won't be done for a number of years. That's so for right. the projects in that boat, that money is protected and will certainly, it Absolutely. can't be taken away from That's right. that project. Absolutely right. Okay, just wanted to make yeah. sure I heard you say that. Yeah. For example, Lansdowne High School, that has been funded. That means now the challenge is on us to complete the design as soon as we can mm -hmm. and build it. Money is there. So we can write checkbooks, check in, you know, checks in from that checkbook. Yeah. That's, no, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, again, because it, it can't happen in a year, and I understand that for sure. Um, and I wasn't able to attend the last board meeting, but I listened to it, and I heard you say that there um, wasn't money budgeted in the state request for Delaney because it had been funded as well. 
Um, but when I looked at the county requests, to House and Delaney seemed to have the same funding amount set aside for them. So could you just explain that a little yes. bit more? So the uh, county has approved design funds for Delaney. So we are starting design of that. Once we get to the stage that the design is ready or ready to bid, we'll ask for construction funding at that time. Now, where would that be in line? I don't know. Okay. Okay, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Dixon, I have a follow-up, but I think we got through all the board members um, that had questions, other board members that had questions, and that it has to do with the state facility assessment scores. I understand those were released to LEAs um, when that process was finished, and there were some stops and starts. Have we compared those to the my iPass scores, and is this, were there any red flags to, I guess that's my first um, question. I and have not seen, I have not seen a complete report from them, and uh, I can check that when they will be available, but no comparison has been made to date. We are uh, quite comfortable with the information in my iPass, and we even refine the information in my iPass for systemics based on additional knowledge that we have. So the information that you are getting, it is about as good as you can get anywhere. So you have not seen the state's facility assessment? I have not assessment. seen state assessment. But I wouldn't be concerned about it um, uh, because we already did a detailed study. We did the detailed study. We compared with our own information that we had before. And not only that, we know from day to day which equipment fails more frequently, which, which equipment needs replacement. And so when you put all of that information together, see, the, the common notion and perception is that there's a numerical way of uh, saying that this boiler or this chiller is the worst, the second worst, the third. There is no way. You know, it, it's like you take 200 cars with different miles, different years, Unless you drive, unless you own, unless you operate, you wouldn't know which one you want to replace. And just the age or just any one assessment cannot, cannot help you determine that. So have faith in our skills, our knowledge, and, uh, and, and we supplement that with all of these studies that we are getting. Sure. So it's my understanding that even though the IAC won't be making funding decisions using their assessment until 2027, yeah. that they will be using the results of their assessment to inform their um, process and to provide that information to LEAs so that if anything does seem um, out of line in terms of the priorities on our CIP, yeah. that they will be sharing that information with LEAs yes. to say this this seems out of line with alignment with what we think your your priority should be based on our assessment. So, so proactively, what I, the reason I ask is because it should, have we done you know or, or are we planning to do that comparison? to ensure that prior to any IAC review, we've identified um, that gap analysis or those, those concerns. Absolutely, we'll do that once we get it. We'll take a look at that, uh, just like we took a look at uh, my iPasses recommendation. So the more knowledge, the more information we have about a system from different evaluation, it helps us. The goal is to take care of the worst rated systems first. And uh, we know, you know, this is the fifth or sixth uh, evaluation in my professional career by different groups in different organizations. So we have a good idea of how important they are and how much knowledge that we have as our own institutional knowledge that can supplement it. So because we have to live with it. We have to live with it 24 hours a day. Sure. And, and the state's writing a check, so they have a vested yeah. interest yeah. in it as well. But if the system is failing, and, and let me give you that another example. If the system is failing, and we know it's going to fail, if they don't pay us, then we go to county to say, can you help us? 
because that system has to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, board members? Mrs. Causey? Thank you for the presentation. Could you please just list the names of the uh, all of the schools that are being considered in the Northeast area, new addition re renovation uh, study, and also the Southeast area, new addition or renovation study that was mentioned by Mr. McMillian earlier? Uh, southeast area is uh, Dundalk High School, Patapsco High School, and Sparrows Point High School. Okay. Uh, right? Did I? And the middle school. Spares Point Middle. Yeah, middle school is, yes. Uh, and the northeast is Perry Hall, Lock Raven, uh, and, and what's the Perry Hall? Kenwood. Kenwood, Overly, which one? I miss, I'm missing. Lock, Lock Raven. Raven. Lock Raven, I said that, yeah. Parkville. 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 Thank you. And so um, the board, I, I dovetail with my other board members that uh, it would be helpful for all of us to see that, and our communities are certainly anxious. Um, that being said, I'm glad to see that Lock Raven High School, the boiler chiller replacement is moving forward. Um, there are other capital projects that I know have been discussed that are not on this list that are being approved. Um, some for similar dollar amounts. Um, can you speak to why all of the capital projects that are being worked on are not on the list, such as Hereford High School's historic barn and Hereford High School's uh, track and the tennis court? And there's also a number of these other schools that have other projects. So these projects that we submit to state, the, the, the program you have in front of you for approval in the next board meeting is for state submission. A lot of other projects that you are mentioning, uh, they are either county projects from one of the categories that you approve, or they are one of the grant projects. That's why they are not on this list. Okay, because the grants that are coming from the state, yeah. either through the governor's office or the legislature. That's right, that's right. Are already approved. Yes. So it's not on the request. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. I, I think the final grant for the barn project is still in the works. They have approved a grant, but there's still more money needed. So I did, didn't want to, uh, there's still efforts being made uh, by the local elected officials to get the additional fund for that. That's my recollection. But we are actively working on it, um, you know, on that, so. Okay. But this, my knowledge, my presentation today is for the state submission. That's what I prepared for. Thank you. So what is um, the rationale for, well, I think it would be helpful to separate the planning and funding that's combined. So I don't know if that can be, request can be facilitated. Also, Towson High School and Delaney High School both received requests for state funding uh, at the same time. And yet Towson has 66, over 66 million in a request, and Delaney has zero. How can, what, what is the explanation for that? Well, Delaney's design is already, uh, the, the design funds are already approved. No state funds are being requested for construction because, because we are not ready for construction yet. Is Towson High School ready for construction? No, the, the Towson's, uh, the county, uh, where is, is it design, is there more than design funds for the? Let me make sure that I understand your question. 23, I'm trying to get to that attachment. Just give me a second.
Yeah, the Towson funds, as I indicated to you in the earlier part, they were from the built to learn funding. That's what, that's what you're looking at. So the Towson funds are for built to learn funds that are available. And was Delaney High School not submitted for the, built for learn, built to learn? But by, by the time we got to Towson High School, all of the built to learn is, is, is depleted. That's the last project, uh, Towson. And at this point, we are not ready for Delaney's, uh, you know, the design work has just started. Towson also does not have its design work yeah, completed. That's right. So someone made a decision to. We have no funds from the county side to support the Delaney project yet for the construction of it. I'm out of time, but I'll send in additional questions okay. because yeah. that's. Yeah. Thank you. That doesn't make sense to me. So um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Okay. Dixit. Excuse me, I had a question. Yes, Ms. Scott. Sorry, okay. I put it that's in chat. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it was very informative. Um, I just wanted to say, one, I was um, glad to see that um, uh, two schools from the Northwest, Deer Park and Scotts Branch Elementary Schools are on there. It looks like two replacement schools that are much needed. Um, I think that and I just wanted to confirm that you had said these recommendations came out of the My iPass report, or did that factor into the decision making a little bit? How did that work? So, uh, yeah, these recommendations, they were part of the Schools for the Future program. That was even before My iPass. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important to know that the. Um, we live in a large county, a diverse county that's comprised of a lot of different schools. So I think that the work that your office does and that you do to look at the county and our schools from a holistic approach based on need is what's needed and very important. Thank you. No, you raise a good point. Uh, like my IPAS indicated, our needs are far greater than the available resources. Uh, so. Uh, we have, we have to be careful about how we spend and where we spend to meet all the needs. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hahn? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixit, for your report, for sharing all of this with us and, and answering all of our questions. I really appreciate that. Um, I just had one clarification just for my sake, just to help me understand a little bit more. So when it comes to the difference between county and state capital budget, I guess so I understand that part of it has to do with how much a project costs. Are there any other, um, I guess, parameters that would differentiate something to be a county, something that we address with the county versus something we address to the state? I know that we have, you know, grants and, and legislation that that would cause some state capital budget requests. But then, um, like, is there any other parameters that I'm missing um, that I should be aware of when examining both of these documents? So let me try to simplify it for you. The task here is to come up with the priority of the project, okay, so that we can all agree upon that this is, this is how we are going to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Those priorities are based upon the condition of the building, educational adequacy and equity, and the capacity needs. Those three factors combine then we make a, a qualitative decision so many times. You know, it's a judgment call, but that judgment call is assisted by studies like my IPASS study, so we get an independent opinion and, and, and make the best decision we can. So once the priority is established, then there is a formula, like a complex set of formula, that decides how much of that is going to be funded by state and how much of that is going to be funded by county? And at what time do they decide to fund it? So we are dependent on, uh, on the benevolence of state and county to fund those projects. But we need to justify that as to why. And when you will get to see the submission that we make from state, um, I hope you uh, spend some time on that. That would be the best educational piece for a new board member to understand how it is done. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Any other questions or comments, board members? Ms. Rowe? Mr. Dixit, I'm familiar with some of the schools in my area, and I would just like you to review those farms. Sorry, Ms. Rowe, you're, mm -hmm. I was told you're out of time. Oh, okay. I apologize. Um, board members can, should submit any additional questions regarding this request to Dr. Williams with a copy to Ms. Gover and Ms. Stifler in preparation for the September 13th vote. Mr. Dixit, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. The next item on the agenda is the report on fourth quarter results, and for that I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Zarchin. The gang's all here this Team. evening. <laughs> Welcome. You use this side. Okay. So uh, good evening, Dr. Williams, Chair Hen, members of the board. Um, I'm Mary McComas, the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Zarchin, our Chief of Schools, um, Mr. Eric Wilson, our Executive Director of Schools, uh, Principal Cortesis, uh, Dr. Elmendorf, and also uh, Mr. Connolly. So we're here this evening to bring forward our fourth quarter reports for the last academic year. Uh, could I have, oh, thank you. Could you go to the next slide, please? You know, our, um, our compass, the pathway to excellence, provides us a system-wide focus on raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing our students for their future. Our dedication to ensuring that our students graduate college and career ready is a thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding key metrics of our student progress along their trajectory of learning. Attendance, suspension, and course performance data inform our decisions that we make as we advocate for equity in student access, opportunity, and achievement. This is just one example of how our compass intentionally raises the bar, closes gaps, and prepares students for their future. This quarterly re uh, results report provides insight into student progress and climate conditions at the system level by student group and for students participating in the VLP for attendance, suspension rate, and course performance. The purpose is to use data as a flashlight to ask questions and to make informed collaborative decisions that support our students and staff moving forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Academic achievement is the current level of student progress as indicated by multiple measures, including classroom, district, and external assessments that evaluate our student learning. Key elements of improving achievement include three interdependent components in the instructional core, specifically our teacher knowledge and skills, our student engagement, and our content. It's important to understand that throughout each academic year, the instructional leadership teams at schools examine school performance based on their targeted student work. And in professional learning communities, our teachers and school leadership use actionable data to make instructional decisions to raise the achievement and prepare every student for success. Each component on the screen before you works uh, synergistically uh, to create a cycle that is data-driven um, and targets uh, resource allocation uh, to, for the continuous improvement um, process. At this point, I'll be followed by uh, Mr. Connolly, who will share with you the data for our fourth quarter. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, promoting attendance rates that meet or exceed the attendance rates uh, state standards for MSDE for all students is an important part of their growth and achievement over time and a critical factor in having access to the compass pathways to success for college, career, and service. Our Board of Education has identified specific attendance goals as part of the focus on safe and supportive learning environments, and we recognize the impact of COVID-19 on the attendance rate at different intervals of time during the previous school year. The homeschool partnership is critical to supporting student attendance and is a high priority initiative across all schools. The National Center for Educational Statistics notes students who attend school regularly have been shown to achieve at higher levels um, 
<clears throat> than students who do not have regular attendance. The chart shown displays school attendance rates by grade span for all four marking periods. Across all grade spans, attendance rates declined from marking period one to marking period two, rebounded slightly in marking period three, but declined again in marking period four. Mr. Wilson will share some strategies schools utilize to maintain high levels of attendance over the course of the school year. Good. Thank you, Mr. Connolly, and we know we're sharing a lot of data with you this evening, so I wanted to front load some of the strategies ahead of time and uh, can't wait until Principal Cortesis gets to, to share from, from her perspective. But when you think about attendance, we know uh, the past couple of years were very challenging for many of our students. So all of our schools initiated what we call school well-being teams. So it's a compilation of school counselors, PPW, principal administrators, social workers, and psychologists that would meet regularly on our students that had very low or, or questionable attendance to make sure we can provide some strategies to support them. Uh, these monitoring teams would make phone calls home to, to families, uh, just address different concerns uh, depending on the need of the student. We would hold family conferences, review attendance plans, and then we would also assign adult mentors to students when possible to check in and motivate students to help them with some of these attendance concerns. Next slide. Actually. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mm -hmm. oh, we, went. we went too far. Could too you go far. back one, one slide? slide. Back, thank please. you. Thank you so much. Uh, this chart shown displays rates of chronic absenteeism by grade span for all four marking periods. A student is considered chronically absent when their attendance rate is at or below 90%. Consistent with attendance rate patterns, chronic absenteeism was highest in marking periods two and four across all grade spans. Schools and central office staff work with parents and care providers to promote consistent on-time attendance. Strategies include beyond what uh, Mr. Wilson had shared, ongoing communication and family partnerships, such as notification through automated messaging, personalized phone calls, direct support from school counselors, PPWs, and social workers, school and parent caregiver conferences, and student attendance plans. Next slide, please. Thank you. System-wide, the suspension rate for all students was less than 3% across all marking periods. Student suspension rates by grade level for marking periods one through four are displayed in the chart shown. The overall suspension rates are comparable to the pre-pandemic 2019-2020 suspension rate data by school level. Overall, suspension rates increased from marking period one to marking period three and declined in marking period four. Elementary schools had the lowest overall suspension rate, followed by high schools, then middle schools. School teams and central office support staff implement a variety of preventative, responsive, and restorative practices to support positive student behavior and safe and supportive learning environments. Prevention involves proactive school-wide strategies such as the BCPS Code of Conduct, mm -hmm. character education, conscious discipline, mentoring, and positive behavior interventions and supports. Responsive strategies are an additional layer of student support to students incorporated across the school environment and flexible in use. School supports may include specific peer mentors for specific uh, purposes, staff mentors, therapeutic services, student support teams, and pupil personnel services. Logical consequences are followed when student behavior warrants disciplinary action and restorative practices work to improve and repair relationships while reestablishing expectations to maintain a safe and supportive learning environment for students and staff. Mr. Wilson will share some specific strategies schools utilize to promote positive behavior and restorative practices. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And Mr. Connolly referenced the uh, student code of conduct, but uh, principals and school teams explicitly taking the time to teach the uh, classroom uh, expectation matrix that's located in the student code of conduct. And you know we're, we're really looking forward to this next school year, taking time in the month of September to really walk students through that uh, code of conduct and what it looks like. Um, above all, it's really about building relationships with our students and helping the adults and, and staff in the building to figure out different ways and strategies in which to do that. Uh, 
Uh, some schools have created mindfulness rooms to help students to re-engage and to re-establish contact. Um, administrative teams working in collaboration with counselors, mentors, PPWs, and parents to sometimes identify uh, different educational options for students, such as an alternative schedule, work study, or independent study. Um, other ideas have included conflict resolution, peer mediation, zones of regulation, which is used to help uh, with some de-escalation strategies for students, and consistent check-in with students during a period of removal. We know sometimes suspension is warranted, but we can't just leave those students just out there. So really taking the time as administrators, teachers, counselors, to check in with the students that are, are not there, letting them know that their education will continue and you're important when we bring you back. But it's really about developing those pro-social skills uh, that reinforce uh, students to make positive behavioral choices. Next slide. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all this work is intentional. As we move in this presentation from looking at attendance to student behavior and discipline, we then come into this part of the presentation, which is about course grades. This slide displays two graphs for elementary course grades. On the left, again, this is for grades four and five. The A through E grade distribution for marking period four is presented for students, again, in grades four and five. As shown, more than two-thirds of students in, in uh, grades four and five earned A's and B's in their core subject areas. In all subject areas, less than 3% of elementary students earned a failing grade in the fourth marking period. On the right, in contrast, are the percentage of students in grades four and five earning a C or higher for core subject areas shown as a comparison across all four marking periods, so a year at a glance. The results indicate that the percentage of students earning a C or higher <coughs> increased from the first marking period to the fourth marking period, approaching or exceeding 90% of all fourth and fifth grade students earning a C or higher. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide displays the same information with a focus on middle school course grades. Again, on the left, the A through E grade distribution for marking period four is presented for middle school students. As shown, more than one half of the students in grades six through eight earned A's and B's in their core subject areas. In all subject areas, less than 15% of middle school students earned a failing grade in the fourth marking period. On the right, the percentage of middle school students um, earning a C or higher for core subject areas is shown as a comparison across all four marking periods. The results indicate that the percent of students earning a C or higher decreased from the first marking period to the fourth marking period, approaching or exceeding 75% of students earning a C or higher. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this. Uh, slide displays the same information with a focus on high school course grades. Once again, on the left, you have the A through E grade distribution, and as shown, approximately one half of students in grades 9 through 12 earned A's and B's in their core subject areas. In all subject areas, approximately 20% of high school students earned a failing grade in the fourth marking period. Once again, on the right, we have the percentage of students earning a C or higher across all four marking periods. The results indicate the percent of students earning a C or higher decreased from the first marking period to the fourth marking period, with less than 70% of students earning a C or higher. I next asked uh, Dr. McComas to share with us some information related to support to schools. Next slide, Thank you. Please. Next. Thank you. And so how is it that we support students in their course performance? So when a student is struggling um, or a student needs to get caught up on learning that may have been interrupted or that they just need reteaching on. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what we do in the curriculum offices. So in the content offices, uh, we have embedded in the curriculum uh, resources that prioritize the standards for each unit, right? So these are the, the, the non-negotiables, the essential learnings for each unit. We also have rich diagnostic tests that at the beginning of each unit so that it helps our teachers understand what foundational knowledge a student is bringing to the, the classroom and which foundational knowledge they may have a gap in. Um, and then we have supplemental instruction 
instructional resources to address uh, those non-negotiables or key uh, learning pieces. So that's, uh, for example, let me give you an example here. In unit one of grade three math, students will learn about addition and subtraction patterns. To begin this unit, curricular supports include acceleration assignments aligned to the prerequisite skills previously taught in grade two, um, including strategies for fluency adding um, and subtracting within 20 using mental math strategies and manip manipulatives such as a number rack. These resources help our teachers to prioritize the content standards and provide instructional experiences for students to address any unfinished or interrupted learning and to reteach concepts based on current uh, performance data. In addition to what happens every day in our classroom, and our principal will be speaking to that shortly, um, we of course um, use our data, and certainly fourth quarter um, is part of our data set to help identify students uh, for summer learning opportunities. You can see on the screen before you the long list of summer learning programs. I know many of you are very familiar with the multitude of summer learning opportunities, and every year I'm proud to say we continue to expand the number of programs um, and resources available to, for students. You can see just this past summer in the month of July, we had 22,591 students participate in in-person learning. Um, in addition to that, every student uh, rising from kindergarten up to 12th grade um, had free online access to literacy and math resources that were uh, virtual and self-paced. So they could go on at any time. I kind of can make the comparison to the old-fashioned uh, math workbook that we may have had or uh, literacy workbook. Um, and those numbers fluctuate week by week throughout the summer. Uh, but on average, we had 1,693 students accessing the literacy uh, self-paced resources um, each week uh, on average. And for the math program, we had, i um, proud to say, 4,542 students on average throughout the summer. Uh, so our students are actively learning throughout the summer, and many of those students are invited to programs and encouraged to participate based on, of course, their um, school performance throughout the school year. So on that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. McComas. So I get to talk about more support to schools uh, from my office. The Department of Schools is, oh, next slide. Thank you. The Department of Schools is the hub through which schools receive direct support. The executive directors within the Department of Schools are charged with ensuring that every school within BCPS is positioned to provide a world-class education for every student. While many believe the executive director of school's job is to only respond to parent phone calls and school emergencies, which are important and which we do, the main role of the executive director of schools is to ensure that school leadership has the instructional capacity to lead in a way that yields high academic outcomes for students. The graphic in this slide shows some of the essential components of the principal supervisor that directly correlate to increased instructional leadership capacity in schools. As the principal supervisor, the executive director of schools monitors, coaches, guides, and provides feedback to the principal in ensuring effective processes and structures are in place in the school for quality teaching and learning to occur. From a monitoring standpoint, multiple data points are studied and analyzed for the purpose of providing additional information to school leadership to support instructional decisions around the school program. These mutual accountability conversations serve to hold school leadership accountable for raising the bar of expectations for staff and students, as well as the principal supervisor for being a part of the process by being in the arena with the principal and deploying necessary supports from central office as needed. Next slide. What kind of support do we provide to schools? Principal supervisors work with their respective schools by leading with multiple measures of data to create a full picture of the level of support a school may need. It is important to note that once the needs are determined in collaboration with the principal, principal supervisors look for immediate opportunities to deploy responsive resources from the central office to the school, specifically content specialists, staff experts in the areas of special education, English as a second language, acceleration, or equitable classroom practices are examples of areas in which schools may need support. 
to ensure executive directors of schools continue to build their own capacity and remain relevant and knowledgeable of new findings and developments regarding state and local assessment measures, a strong collaboration occurs between various school system offices to ensure common messages are communicated to schools. One structure that allows for principal supervisors to build capacity around various school system measures is our cross-divisional executive director meetings with some of my colleagues at the table. During this time, executive directors from all the divisions from across the system come together to engage in discussion, reflection, and learning about system and state initiatives to support in our roles as leaders in monitoring and supporting schools. This allows for a strong collaboration across the system as directors are lead learning together and discussing the best way to support schools. So what does all this mean? So to discuss what all of this means to school leaders, teachers, and students, I am so pleased to introduce Ms. Lori Cortesis, proud principal of McCormick Elementary School. Ms. Cortesis will provide an in-depth view of how data is woven into the big picture of teaching, learning, and monitoring student achievement. Ms. Cortesis, next slide. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, and good evening, everyone. I am proud, I'm honored, and I'm absolutely thrilled to share with you our school journey based on care, teaching, learning, and outcomes for our children, and our success thus far using systems and structures put into place to increase student success and collaboration of our school family, including teachers, parents, and students. Our work comes from the heart, and it cares about its family, yet it understands the commitment and the perseverance needed to grow its students and their love of learning. Involving all stakeholders, we realized the beginning years were critical to setting the tone, the environment, and the expectations for behavior. Without feeling safe and secure in an environment that welcomes you, optimal learning would not occur. With intentionality, purpose, a lot of discussion and decision making, systems were developed and disproportionality with suspensions for which we were previously identified by the state are officially now a part of our past. I am very proud of our students as they are of themselves and our behavior data proves it. With that being said, I am also a realist and I know that this work never ends. We must always monitor our system and keep our foundation from falling apart. As the global pandemic emerged, plans of action had to be developed to overcome and continue with the work. And that is exactly what my McCormick family did. Our school family understood that the interruption due to the pandemic was not a deletion nor a substitute for instruction, but rather an opportunity to reflect and reset our next steps forward. During this time, our school family worked together and discussed strategies for continued learning in our new platform, technology. While where and when learning took place may have changed during the pandemic, what learning, and more importantly, the reason why we needed to continue our way forward, never changed. We also realized the time would come when we would all return to the schoolhouse and the changes for instruction would take place. This was a terrific opportunity that was presented to us to reset using all that we knew and all that we had learned. As we transitioned from home to the schoolhouse, in collaboration with members of our instructional leadership team and Mr. Wilson, we pre-planned and we developed the next steps to our school progress plan key actions for face-to-face -face instruction. For our youngest learners, preschool K and 1, we scheduled resources to support with small group instruction and progress monitoring. For our grade 2 to 5 students, we developed a data protocol to be introduced and used by all classroom teachers to support student learning and measure progress in math and ELA throughout the entire school year. To be responsive, all stakeholders in our school family were involved in the process of using the protocol in one way or another. Student achievement and performance matters is part of our daily life at McCormick, being monitored often and consistently by administration and our ILT team and used for support of student learning. Our resource personnel 
are responsible for disaggregating the data for teachers so they so the teachers can spend most of their time concentrating on mastery of content and teaching practices for our kids. Our team works closely to monitor the implementation of professional development in classroom use, to develop a consistent approach to implementing the content through effective first instruction, and measure progress through leading data, using our unit assessments in performance matters as our guiding tool towards progress. So pictured here, Pictured here is the protocol all classroom teachers consistently utilize to ensure students are growing and achieving. With the onset of the new math bridges and number corner curriculum, it was imperative that we increase teacher capacity and understanding of the Common Core standards, while also addressing student needs reflected in our data from pre to post assessment, and measure that progress intermittently and frequently throughout our units of study. Teachers received ongoing professional development aligned to the SPP key actions and the established protocol, met and planned content with their grade level partners, discussed implementation strategies with grade level assigned mentors, resource teachers, and received ongoing feedback from administrators as they utilized the school-based effective first instruction tool to implement the protocol that we developed with Fidelity. Parents also always knew what was taught in the classroom and what was next in teaching and learning. Teachers continuously send information to families communicating student progress with standards and content from beginning and throughout a unit of study. Review information and parent trainings are held to inform families of new learning via family engagement events through our Title I. We have provided every parent with access to the unit overview, which is an opportunity for feedback from trainings that we also hold in parent university at our school, <coughs> excuse me, and ongoing dialogue. In addition, there are a multitude of tutoring sessions after school that have been provided to support student learning and skill-based support. Parents receive constant communication via school messenger regarding work and reviews for student practice. They also receive personal phone calls from me regarding their child's academic progress and units of study, which in turn strengthens our partnership in the business of educating their child. Our youngest pre-K to two students have weekly reinforcement packets going home supporting identification of letters and sight words. They have practice material to increase fluency and comprehension activities to increase understanding. And since I've shared this information with you, you're probably wondering, well, did your protocol work? Next slide, please. Utilizing this protocol thus far has had a positive impact. Teachers have reduced their office referrals by 95% due to a higher level of student engagement in achieving academic goals. Suspensions were less than 1%, and teachers are increasingly becoming experts in understanding and implementing the standards to meet student needs. Most importantly, the results for students show us there has been a significant decrease in office referrals, a 75% increase in positive office referrals, more students attending the monthly behavior incentive, 95% or more reaching their monthly goals, more students achieving on end of unit assessments with some grades achieving 100% meeting or exceeding. The impact on our students' learning has been positive thus far. Students have increased their love of reading and are becoming more engaged in thinking about their own learning. Next slide, please. So our journey for the 2021-2022 school year might have concluded, but our work continues into this year because learning and teaching never end. They just evolve. At McCormick, learning is ongoing and continuous for both our students and our staff. Our business is education and our work is equity. As the principal who insists on a family first motto, our mission and vision has been and always will be the support of student learning and providing an excellent education for all students so that they may become productive contributing members of our society in the future. Our school family will continue to work together to provide our students the high level of education needed through access and opportunity. And as I mentioned in the beginning, interruptions, no matter how big or how small they are, they are a part of life. And they can either be seen as a challenge or as an opportunity. 
Well, when you see it as an opportunity, which my school family and I do, amazing learning really can take place whenever and wherever that may be, as long as the focus remains with students at the center. And we at McCormick will continue to grow learning for everyone, including myself. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our evolving story of hard work and dedication by my superstar staff and my amazing students. And next, Dr. Elmendorf will share the marking period for results for our virtual learning program or VLP. Thank you, Ms. Cortezas. Attendance rates in the VLP have decreased slightly from marking period three to marking period four, but continue to hover around 90% for elementary and middle school students, which is aligned with system-wide attendance rates. This summer, VLP staff has taken what they have learned about attendance from the first year of the program's implementation to enhance plans to encourage, monitor, and respond to student attendance in the 2022-2023 school year. The VLP levels are also transitioning from an office progress plan to three separate school progress plans and will include strategies to support student attendance. Next slide, please. The course distribution charts for each level of the VLP are displayed for marking period four. The elementary school chart reflects the grades earned by students in grades four and five with subject area passing rates ranging from 84% in social studies to slightly above 89% in mathematics. The middle school VLP grade performance indicates course passage rates that span from slightly above 74% in English language arts to 88% in social studies. Finally, in the high school program, course passage rates range from 66% in English language arts to 78% in science. Next slide, please. The grade distribution charts are displayed for marking period four and the percentage of students earning grades of C or better are shown for all four marking periods. In the elementary school VLP, all subject areas showed growth when comparing the percentage of students who earned grades of C or higher in marking period one to marking period four with gains of 1% in English language arts, nearly 3% in mathematics, 11% in science, and 14% in social studies. In the middle school VLP, 66% of students earned a grade of C or higher in mathematics, an increase of nearly 2% when comparing marking period one to marking period four. Per performance in social studies also improved with nearly 75% of students earning a grade of C or higher in marking period four. In the high school VLP, the percentage of students earning a grade of C or better in mathematics increased by slightly over 5% over the span of the school year. This summer, teachers and leadership teams in the VLP have been participating in professional development specific to online pedagogical strategies and participating in shared planning in order to impact student course performance. Additionally, at the end of the 21-22 school year, VLP staff worked with families and home schools to facilitate a return to in-person learning for students whose academic profile warranted this adjustment. Next slide, please. On the screen before you, we have our schedule of academic re achievement reports over the last 12 months. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. At this point, I'll open it up to board members to ask questions. Ms. Jose? Thank you for this present. Thank you for this presentation. Um, we saw that in slide seven, elementary school, we see 10 to 12 percent of the students getting a D and an E in ELA and math. And you see that doubling up in middle school and further the gap keeps increasing in high school. And as you stare at this data and you talk to teachers and administrators, there has to be an aha moment that has to hit, right, when you look at this data. Uh, also, Mr. Co Ms. Cortez, thank you for um, all the good work you and your staff have done and continue to do. And there were several strategies and supports provided interventions um, to end those gaps. We saw that in middle school, you have the highest suspension rates, and then it kind of wanes down. Um, Mrs. Uh, Cortez, you said that the suspension date was data was identified by the state in your school. Can you elaborate on that, how you address that? And my second part of the question is to Dr. Williams and Ms. McComas. Whatever remedial measures were identified at McCormick, is that implemented statewide, state uh, system-wide? And when can we see the needle shift on this? 
I know I asked a lot of questions. So uh, we'll take your questions in order, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. No problem. Um, um, I wanted to let you know that we um, received information from the Office of School Climate, and so we used that information um, to determine what needed to be done in order, because they were saying that we were disproportionately suspending students, um, and what we had to do was look at our subgroup data, and we had to create systems and structures, basically, to identify and create a plan of action for each of the students and for the small groups that were identified. And that is how we got off the list. Can you explain disproportionately suspending yes. students based on what? Yes. It, um, ours was um, African-American males were being suspended at a higher rate than other subgroups. However, they are the majority of our school population are African-American students. And therefore, what we had to do was, because it was a, a smaller portion, we had to identify what the plan of action was going to be to support them. Thank you. Could sure. you um, specify your school demographics? Okay, so we so don't quote me on this, but because they change every day. Um, but we are approximately 87% um, African American, um, approximately 3% white, 7% uh, Hispanic, and other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So part two question, uh, what are we doing to move the needle? You know, we have brought forward really a, an excellent example of a school leader who digs into the work. You know, you, we, we heard our principal talk about the day in and day out work with our faculty around understanding the rigor of the standard um, and making sure that the work that's happening in classrooms every day with, with our children meets the rigor of that standard. Um, it, our principal really described rolling up her sleeves and getting in there and working directly with faculty consistently. That is really what needs to happen, and that is what our um, Department of Schools executive team uh, is working with our principals on. So when we talk about professional learning communities, we talk about instructional leadership teams, uh, we talk about the, the day in and day out hard work of looking at student work samples and, and evaluating the rigor of that. I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself, but so I'll invite my uh, Department of Schools colleagues to add comment to like bring that to another level of description. Sure, thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, so yes, so just getting consistency and traction with the opportunity to bring principals out of their buildings, bringing them together in a PLC structure, that's really what we're looking forward to this year. So all the strategies that you just heard about that are happening at McCormick, and they're happening at other schools as well, but just bringing, having opportunities to bring the principals together to not only talk about the strategies, but let's go to McCormick, let's do some instructional rounds and take a look so that way we can help to operationalize at a system-wide level a lot of these best practices and remember not every school is the same so you know deciding all right what part of McCormick is going to work for my school but just providing that platform for principals to come together we're really looking forward to that this year well let me just add we have 176 schools 176 principals they are the data analysts of their schools. And more importantly, they know their students. So as Mr. Wilson said, they have to customize looking at their data, looking at all kinds of data to determine what their school progress plans will be, what will be the steps. And a lot of it is around their own professional learning, the professional learning of their staff, and then the monitoring. It was this board that approved one of our contracts that we were able to have on-time data about students. We didn't have that. We had to wait for an assessment that would take months to get results. So you heard reference to our curriculum-based assessments. That's on-time data we can have, which, in, which then will inform next steps of what staff members can do in those conversations that are happening in every building with their instructional leader t leadership team. You, you referenced middle school. I'm glad you did because day one I came in, I said we have to focus on middle schools. I gave an example to our principals about the middle school child. No offense to anyone on the dais who may be the middle school child, but sometimes they are not seen. 
so therefore, we focus this year, thank you to Dr. Eric Miners, uh, Miss Larissa Santos for focusing on a responsive middle school summit, brought all our middle school principals together and did just that. Let's talk about what we need to do and those opportunities for students at the middle school. And the last thing you mentioned, which I love, is that you can't look at elementary, this data, and say elementary will then feed into high, middle school, will feed into high school because our articulation patterns are, are quite interesting. You don't necessarily have feeder schools. We do have some, they all are not direct feeder schools. Hence why we created the system improvement teams and a piece of that work is there are 11 system improvement teams. There's the piece around academics. We're looking at reading, we're looking at algebra one, we're looking at suspension, we're looking at all the other assessments, SAT, AP to really look at what are those best practices that should be happening across all schools so we can replicate. And then the work of the schools, they come in, they monitor, they ask questions. And so this is the work. We started this pre-pandemic. The pandemic hit. We had to focus on adjusting and trying to get kids connected with, with, with staff. This past year, we started to increase that through that work, and we feel confident that this year we're able to provide additional work related to our strategic plan. Thanks to this board that approved the new strategic plan of June 2020. So I hope that answers your questions. We can talk all day about academics. <laughs> Thank you. Same. Dr. Hager, I believe you are next. Yes, and I have a lot of questions, so I'm going to talk really fast. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I especially want to thank Dr. Williams and, and the team for their transparency and willingness to share this data because some of it wasn't super positive. And so your willingness to just let us know what's happening is, is really important, and I really thank you for that. Um, I'm going to start with a comment that's a broken record for me, is that um, better comparisons would really help us understand the data better. So having comparisons, uh, looking at other years, other counties, to really understand you know, where, where this year is compared to prior years, again, or compared to other similar counties. For the virtual learning program, having comparisons, looking at the children themselves, uh, their trajectories over time, or a matched control, because it is likely that the children in the virtual learning program are slightly different than the population as a whole, and we can't help but to compare them in this, uh, the way the data is presented. So I know I've said that before, but I had to say it again. Um, so starting with grades, um, in the fourth quarter, about 15% of middle school students failed the major grades. About 20% of high school students got a failing grade in the, in the major subjects. Um, and then we heard about summer school, and we were told they were invited to participate. They were not required. Is that? I mean, I know it's only fourth quarter, so they would have to have failed the course overall, I assume, to... Yeah, so I... Oh, well, Go ahead. sorry if I'm jumping yeah, no, the gun. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify for that. So... Yes, students are encouraged to enroll in summer school. It is not a mandate, you know. So, for example, when we're talking about high school students, if they are failing, then they are behind on credits. Summer school is their opportunity to get caught up on credits. If they don't take opportunity during the summertime, maybe they have to work for their family. Maybe they have other obligations that they're not able to participate in the summer um, opportunity. Then we work with the school throughout the school year for them to perhaps uh, do the extended day program during the school year where they can get caught up on credits or the Saturday program um, or uh, embed in the school day in their schedule the opportunity to get caught up. So the summer learning opportunity for our students who are um, – acquiring credits towards graduation, that is one more window of opportunity. It's not a now's your only opportunity. Um, it's part of a menu of ways for us to, to get students up to speed or for students to accelerate. We do have students who participate in summer learning who are getting ahead on their credits because maybe they're choosing to graduate early. Uh, it may be that they're trying to get ahead of, on certain credits so that they can open up other electives during the school year. So it's important to think about summer school uh, not as this sort of, um, you know, if you don't pass, you know, go, you can't progress, or if you don't do this, you can't progress. There's many opportunities. For students who uh, likewise are at the elementary and middle schools, uh, we work with their families to get them enrolled in summer school. If a family chooses not to participate in 
summer school for whatever reason. Um, again, we work throughout the school year uh, to identify what interventions that students would need um, incorporate into their school schedule. Uh, we work to provide tutoring throughout the school year. Uh, we have expanded a lot of our after school tutoring thanks to the federal grant funds that have come in. And so what's in really important to understand is, is that it's not about a one Shop, one stop opportunity for students to close gaps or to get ahead. It's really about providing a menu of opportunities that are flexible. Uh, summer learning is just one piece of that uh, menu. So if a student fails English in ninth grade and cannot go to summer school that year, they will go into 10th grade English and then have an opportunity to make up ninth grade English after school? So we would work with them to identify um, the English courses for their next year. It may be that they are re-enrolled in English 9. It may be that um, they do English 9 in the evening program while they're also in English 10. What's important to understand about uh, the English course, for example, is really the complexity of the text that distinguishes the grade levels um, and the complexity of the writing requirements. And so they are not, if you will, sequential where you must do one from the other. Oftentimes being expo exposed to multiple t uh, levels of text simultaneously can actually help develop comprehension uh, and better um, reading skills. And so English, for example, is one that you can work uh, with students concurrently because it's really about exposure and opportunity to engage in close reading, um, as opposed to, for example, a math course where you need that sequential building of skills prior to progressing to the next one. So speaking of ELA, the VLP ELA fail rate was particularly high for ELA compared to the other subjects. Why do you think that is? I, I don't want to speculate without having specific data that would um, really illuminate why, what the, the reasons are for that. I do know that, um, as I explained in some of the other board meetings, the there were some challenges that we have fortunately overcome for next school year. So we're fully staffed for the VLP for this coming school year. Um, we know that we had a high percentage of long-term substitutes who didn't necessarily have the professional training that we would like to see in certified teachers. And so I think some of the um, challenges that we faced both at home and in the uh, staffing model that we were um, experiencing were part of the what we we saw with the English grades. I just sure. wondered if it was like typing or reading on the computer or something that, because it was so, it's such an outlier. I don't know. Right. Something like that. Um, all right, last question, unless I have more time. Um, the strategies that were all mentioned to kind of make up for, for the um, concerns that we had about some of the data points, um, are they, were they all implemented this year for the first time or have they been in place for years? I mean, are these new things? I think in some respects, um, they're, they're not new. They just had to be repackaged as we were, you know, dealing with the pandemic and coming into the endemic part of it. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, really, really making sure that teachers took an opportunity to learn how to build relationships with students. Because I, I think sometimes we just want to just pour right into our content, whether it be elementary, middle, or high school. And students, I don't think we're really ready for, for that. And so that was a lesson that we learned kind of coming back in last year. So I think the, the strategies were there. I just think we've just taken time to explicitly kind of go back and, and teach some of those as, as adults. Yeah. Thank you. Mrs. Song? Thank you, and thank you guys so much for this awesome presentation and this report and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, I know I was enlightened by this presentation, so thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions, a couple of comments. I want to start off with talking about middle school. Um, and, you know, as a former middle school student, I think I can speak to, I guess, the, the transition of being a middle schooler. I think it's important to recognize that middle school in general, I feel like is a more difficult time developmentally um, in comparison to high school, and that just happens to be how hormones work. Um, so I appreciate that we are being honest about our numbers in middle school and, and how we can improve upon those numbers. Um, because it is important to recognize that we have to look at it holistically. So thank you for that. 
Um, I do want to talk about um, burnout and mental health, because when we look at the numbers, we see that we see us like a decline in the fourth quarter. And I can personally say that a lot of it is due to burnout. I don't know if that's the same thing for everyone, the same case for every student. But I know that a lot of it can be attributed to burnout. So I guess how can we work together to make sure that we are minimizing that burnout for all of our students, elementary, middle and high school, so that they're consistently engaged with what they're learning? I'll jump in. <laughs> and feel free, Dr. Sargent. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, you raise a great question, Roa, um, that, or Ms. Hassan, sorry, um, that, you know, it's important for us to recognize that the school year is a human race, right? Like, this is humans working through a long course of, 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 um, challenges. Um, it's really important, I think, what helps students is, um, extracurricular activities. It's important for every person, no matter what age, to engage in creative activities that reignite their energy, right? And fuel their imagination and, and reconnect them with the joy of living. And I think it's really important for our students um, to not overextend themselves, but to make sure that there is some extracurricular activity um, that they are connected with that really does reignite that energy of creativity, innovation, and joy, right? Uh, and for some, that may be theater. For some, that may be athletics. Uh, for others, it may be music and other forms of fine arts. Um, I think that in, in our culture, we um, have to very intentionally cultivate that for students and for one another to av avoid burnout. We do have a Mind Over Matters campaign that really helps um, with strategies for students to learn how to manage their stress throughout the year. Um, and I think that, you know, um, there is a ton of ways, but we need to work with students early in the year, but throughout the year. And I think it's really important to help students find balance and joy in the learning process. Um, so I don't want to belabor that because uh, we're humans first. And I'll see if any of my colleagues would like to add to that. Thank you. Go ahead and jump in. <laughs> so the past two, really two years, one of the things that we're really trying to establish are relationships, peer to peer peer to adult in a supportive way. What you're seeing at this table is something that we strive for, working across offices, really to get supports to schools where they're needed. Having conversations about what's working and what needs to be improved. The data is not where we want it to be. We're not gonna pretend that it is. We know that it's gonna get better. It's going to get better when we look and really commit to relationships focused on support, but having honest conversations about where we need to move instruction, where we need to move students, where they're not meeting potential. Students need to believe in themselves, and a lot of times that's fostered by a relationship with an adult who's there consistently, who believes in them, and sees something that often the students don't. Um, last meeting, we were asked about suspensions and what did we think, and the feeling was it was improving. The data bears that out. We're also feeling that we're getting some momentum with relationships, a rhythm, and a rhyme to the day, which is incredibly important. And I think with that, we're gonna see the improvements that we really want in schools and, and kids meeting potential and being pushed to do their best and, and to strive to continually improve. So those are things that, that we work on professionally, but we want that to get right down to the student level. Thank you, and I think I think that is an important thing to to realize and to discuss that relationships are at the core of our system, and without them, we will collapse and it will be a mess. And um, so, I think it's important that we did talk about that. Um, another question I had: so, um, in elementary schools, you know, the data says that. Students tend to do better in science and social studies versus English and math. And I'm just trying to like pinpoint why and where that happens. I don't, like, is it a relevancy thing? Is it that students feel more connected with that because it seems more interesting? I don't know. I was going to say, um, 
yeah, I'd like to address that one. Um, I think a lot of it has to do, sometimes it has to do with the content, but it is also student interest. It is the opportunities that we provide for kids to participate in hands-on um, experiments. Um, a lot of times creating timelines for social studies, doing research using the computer. Um, so the venues that we use. Um, so if we're using that across all content areas, we do start to see that increase. Um, and it's also providing that in classroom libraries at the elementary level for kids. So initially they explore what is of interest to them, but as we go through and we build fiction and nonfiction into those classroom libraries, kids start to get exposure to various content. So it actually starts to grow literally across areas. And when we incorporate and blend learning with math and science or reading in social studies, it doesn't become this separate entity. It actually just becomes one type of learning. So um, I know we're very concentrated at the, on doing that at the elementary level, and I think we're, we're starting to see more kids um, bring in their own ideas and implement them. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. These, those are all of the questions that I have at the moment, so I'm going to pass it on to someone else. Mr. McMillian? Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Conley, I'll just refresh my memory. Are suspended students logged in as excused absences? Um, I do not um, do the focus work when it comes to coding students for logging in, so I don't want to give you misinformation. So I'm, I'm sorry, I dropped my earplug. Uh, that, that's okay. Um, from a coding standpoint for suspensions, students that are suspended from school are out of school, which is the out of school suspension. There's also an in school suspension designation. But from a focus standpoint, which is our student information system, I, I can't answer that question for you accurately because I'm not working in that field. Okay. Uh, Dr. Elm, is there anyone from the school side that could... How many kids did you have in, uh, in the VLE in 21-22 about the ballpark? Yeah, we had um, up to 3,200 students in the VLP last year, and we're closer to 1,600 for this coming school year. And you said, what about 1,600? That's, that's the enrollment, about the approximate enrollment for full-time students in this coming school year. And so it went down 1,600? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yes, Eric. Oh, I'm sorry. Our uh, goal is to return students to in-person right, learning. Right. <laughs> Even the ones that are doing great. Well, w what we did is those students who were not doing successful, clearly the format was not working for them, we were working to get them back into in-person learning. So this year we're, and I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Elmendor, um, this year we have students who were demonstrating greater success in the program. So there's a, a standard, if they don't maintain that standard, then they're, they're sent back to their traditional homeschool? Right, we had meetings with the families and the staff for students who were struggling in the VLP to determine if there was something we could put in place to help them to be successful. And if we really felt that the answer to the, the challenge was for them to be back to in-person learning, we, um, we requested that they move back to the, uh, to the school and, building. And uh, Dr. McComas, do you project this VLE program is gonna just drift away to nothing? Well, that, it's a great question, Mr. McMillian, and I know you're passionate about uh, an online opportunity for our students. We are in the process of examining how our students are doing this year. You know, we're starting this year very differently uh, with VLP. Our staffing is stronger. Uh, our students who are in the program have demonstrated that they're doing well in the program. We are looking at um, what are some of the um, evolutions of VLP. Uh, we right now are also working um, to provide lots of uh, uh, innovative and uh, reimagined ways of supporting schools with VLP in some sections um, to help with the overall system-wide staffing. So long story short, I, I cannot say to you, Mr. McMillian, that I see it totally fading away. What I do anticipate is that it will um, go through a metamorphosis as we move forward. It's important to keep in mind that currently our VLP is funded through uh, our ESSER federal grants. And as we all know, those, those grants will sunset at some point. Um, and so it's not currently part of our um, operating budget. Uh, and so we will be um, looking to uh, understand the needs of our system, and then how do we move forward taking the best of what we've learned through the virtual learning program um, and matching that with what would be sustainable funding. 
Thank you. You're uh, Dr. Elmendorf, you stated that you don't have any vacancies in your setting this coming year? The VLP is fully staffed, yes. Outstanding. And Pre Principal Cortez? Yes. <laughs> Did I say that right? Yes. That's exactly. <laughs> You have approximately 475 kids in your school? Approximately 400 at this time. 400. Mm -hmm. And uh, congratulations on your progress. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How many teacher openings do you have? Currently, I have one vacancy that has been taken by a resource teacher, so I'm fully staffed. And what, and grade, had, what grade level is that? I'm what sorry. What grade level is that? Um, fourth grade. Fourth grade. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mrs. Stolowski? Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I just have two questions. The first one is related to attendance. Um, I see that the percentages for chronic absenteeism range from 18.6% to 42.2%. And you talked about one of the strategies was um, a student attendance plan. What percent of students that fall into that chronic absenteeism level um, currently, you know, had a student attendance plan in the past year. So I don't have the, the data in front of me, but I would say from my perspective in the schools that I support, 100% of the students, because that's, that's the point, right, is okay. right, getting those kids the support that they need. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And did it result in improvements in their attendance? I would say it, it fluctuated because, you know, in, in some cases you're dealing with some fear of the unknown from parents. I mean, there was a lot going on last year. So as much as we were, you know, saying it's safe to come back, come on, there was still some reluctancy there with some of our parents. So I think that that played a large role into it. But I think the motivating phone calls, the, the checking up, the knowing that there's someone there that is really interested in them being there really helped for a majority of our students. Okay. And then just as a follow-up, are there any changes planned for the student attendance plan to try to continue to improve in t attendance? Just we, we hope to lower the number that receive a plan for next year, but I think the, the process is working. That collaboration with the uh, school partners is working, so we'll continue that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And my second question is specific to McCormick. Um, as a former teacher, I really admire um, what you said about viewing interruption as an opportunity. Um, and certainly, I know parents and students from sort of the other side of a disruption, where it can be viewed that the disruption is taking away learning from a child. Can you just enlighten a little bit about how you handle viewing classroom disruptions as an opportunity, perhaps with examples, or just sort of your general strategy regarding that? Thank you. Sure. You're talking about in terms of classroom disruptions. Um, so at the elementary level, we want everything to be a learning opportunity. Um, so a lot of the times we will have conversations. Um, we have peer mentors. We have uh, an adult assigned to each student in the building. Um, we're fortunate because we're a smaller school. So um, with that, we... We work collaboratively, and it's ongoing. So um, what we do is basically have check-in systems. We have, in our master schedule, built a community circle time for all classrooms. And we also have midday check-ins. Um, and teachers have structures that they've put in place with successes and challenges that kids identify in the community circles. And they also set daily goals for kids. Kids have their own individual goals, but they also have um, classroom goals. So they, they check on each other. So it really creates more of a family environment. And what I found is it really is a way of being because when we're consistent in the messaging that we're sending out and we're developing that initially from the, the start when the kids come into the classroom um, with conscious discipline greets, we're an avid school, we do avid greets, um, we've put different systems in place so that that can be successful. When we do that and we're consistent and all classrooms do that, because on any given day you can walk into any classroom and you will see um, goals, behavior goals and academic goals set for students individually and as a classroom. And it really does support it. And kids know their numbers and they're very, they're very on to you know, wanting to meet their goals. And they, they intrinsically feel success with that. And I, I, I'm a um, half glass full 
principle um, where I like to um, see things as a, a positive way forward and find opportunities to have conversations to grow people, grow kids, um, have conversations with parents that are realistic. Um, and when I call, I know it individually for me as a principal, when I contact parents, I don't necessarily call for office referrals. I will call, like I mentioned, about a unit of study that kids are on or a student's progress. Um, I work closely with my ILT team, Mr. Wilson, and what we do is we basically set that framework um, and we stay within that framework so we're, we're all clear on the messaging. We're not going from here to there. Um, it's really clear our professional development plans, our behavior plans are all preset and pre-planned and we make adjustments along the way, but we're very hands-on in our building. Um, and I believe Ms. Rowe at one time had visited our building, and yes, and she had seen that, um, uh, of how we structure things. Um, the specific details of our behavior plan, I'd love to share it with you. Um, unfortunately, I don't have everything in front of me, but we have um, that system put in place from a while ago. And so um, the familiarity and the relationship building we have had has been beneficial for us. As a compliment to you and your school, it would be absolutely wonderful if some of your best practices could sure. really be shared among absolutely. other schools. I mean, absolutely. really phenomenal. I would love to do that. Doing. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Once again, I will put in a plug as to why we've created the systems improvement team to do just that. When we see practices happening in schools or clusters of schools, we share that. Our professional learning development, thanks to our PLD, thanks to Heather Lagerman and her team, um, which coordinate these monthly meetings with principals, is to do that, Ms. Zaleski, to share information and provide best practices. Great. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Sorry, I don't, for some reason my teams won't log into the meeting, so I can't put in the chat. Um, so the question I have is related to, um, from the standpoint of being a parent, and you get your kids' MAP scores, you get your kids' MCAP scores, and then you get their grades. And if you work these percentages backwards from the MCAP scores, what I'm seeing in the data when you look at everything is that it looks like for a child to be proficient in MCAT, they have to pretty much be a straight A student. Maybe some of the B students get in, but a lot of the Bs and the Cs are not actually proficient in MCAT. Can you go over the correlation between a student's grades and their MCAT performance? I can start with Thank well, let me, let me just summarize quickly. The grade is a, is a accumulation of work in four periods, four marking periods, where MCAP is an assessment, one assessment at a particular time. So if you think about opportunities to demonstrate learning in nine months versus sitting for a test, you can equate it to your driver's license test, right? You've studied, you studied, and you went and take the assessment and may not have done well. So, so grades, we looked at this with um, Mr. Connolly um, just to look at our strategic plan and those benchmarks in grades second, fifth, eighth, and 10th to look at what are our students doing and their success. So if you go back and look at a strategic plan, you look at there's certain data points we wanna look at to see how our students are progressing. But I just wanna give that preview before Mr. Connolly speaks. It is a difference, and I think that question has come up, um, looking at uh, a collection of work versus a day in time when a student has taken that MCAT. Mr. Conley. Okay. Thank you. Anything else to add? Uh, thank you for setting the table. That was fantastic. Um, so if we look at MCAP, it's a once a year type of assessment. Can you run the mic? Oh, sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. If we look at MCAP, that's a once a year type of assessment, and it's specific to a set of standards for a grade level. When we look at, but it's not all the standards, it's some of the standards, uh, what they consider from the state, um, and different ways that students demonstrate that. So it's like a snapshot of overall learning. MAP um, is given two or three times a year depending on the grade level of a student. So that's a little bit closer to the instructional level where the student was at during that testing time. But the closest 
um, that we get to instruction for students are looking at individual assessments, looking at the formative assessments that drive responsive teaching, and that equates over time to course grades. Within a course grade category, you could have a grade level course, you could have an honors course, you could have an AP course, you could have advanced academics. So there's a lot of different courses that fit into a course grade. So you'd really want to separate out you know, the type of courses that you're looking at in the grades. Not every honors student earns an A, yet they may be proficient in MCAP. Not every student in the general track who earns an A may be proficient in MCAP. And so there isn't a direct correlation between what assessment and time and then a comparison of course grades across all the different options for that course. Okay, so there's not really a correlation then. So you have to take them as two completely separate things? So what we looked at specifically was that the ratio of students who are C or higher in their courses, a comparison of the percentile performance for MAP, and the correlation between those two data points and a student being proficient in MCAP. And of course, MCAP is a variety of assessments. You have grades three through eight, ELA and math. You have algebra one, algebra two, geometry. You have ELA 10, you have government. Uh, you have a high school MISA, which is the Maryland Integrated mm -hmm. Science Assessments. You have a grade five science, a grade eight science, and a grade eight social studies. So there's a lot of different MCAP assessments that are given. Um, what is happening right now with Maryland is that they're going through standard setting. So they're looking at all of their new assessments, they're changing the proficiency levels, which again uh, will cause us to go back and take a look and see how well can we predict student proficiency in MCAP. But that's going to be a new set of data that we'll start looking at based on the new assessments and the new standard setting. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say is um, in response to what um, Ms. Hassan said about burnout, one thing that I've noticed with my three kids in three different schools with three different grade books is that the level of anxiety caused in the fourth quarter has a lot to do with the fact that there are fewer grades in the grade book in the fourth quarter because of the amount of spent time spent in the fourth quarter on standardized tests. And those grades are slower to enter the grade book online, which means the kids have fewer grades and they don't really know always how they're doing overall. And so I've always had to remind my kids in the third quarter, don't procrastinate the fourth quarter. You're not going to have as many grades, but I feel like my kids are all straight A students. They can understand that and do it. Maybe there needs to be some extra credit opportunities or other opportunities to demonstrate knowledge of the material in the fourth quarter than other quarters that kids can do on their own so that they have ways of demonstrating when there's no grades. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rob. That's time. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. This is um, a lot of information. There have been a lot of great questions already. Um, I, I want to focus on attendance and its correlation with grades, because um, I'm wondering, I know it doesn't exactly line up here in that light, but it feels like there must be an immediate correlation between the two. Can you please speak to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. So the Center for Educational Studies, which works with the federal government and databases, has done extensive studies with the correlation between attendance and student achievement overall. Um, to bring that down to the level of a school and a student and a course um, brings in a lot of different variables. You may have a student that will do well in a course. that doesn't attend and that has happened for some of uh, students that I've worked with in the past where they were a GT and when we had that conversation and set up attendance monitoring and plans um, one of the comments is well they're doing fine anyway and are they really meeting their potential um, and that's what we start talking about enrichment and going above and beyond um, attendance provides you an opportunity to learn being present um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're engaged so there's a layer to that that Ms. Hassan brought up um, we 
we have multiple things that we need to do, but first of all, we have to get you in the building. In order for you to be in the game, you gotta be present. And once you're present, we have to give you the right playbook, we have to provide you the right coaching, we have to provide you the right support, and heaven forbid, if, if there's uh, an injury, we have to go and, and help you get better so that you can continue to make progress and uh, fulfill you, uh, to the highest level of success. So yes, at a national level, there are uh, lots of research to support attendance and a correlation with academic achievement. At the schoolhouse level, we know that that's one part of a multifaceted process to support students in um, developing the skills and strategies necessary to perform at the highest levels of their own personal achievement. So I, I appreciate uh, your answer, thank you. Um, but I, I do wanna drill down a, a little bit further because although the national level may support some of the discussion here, I'm, I'm really focused on what's happening here and the fact that um, there's an intervention focused on trying to prevent the absenteeism. And I wanna understand our success and how we're measuring that and how it's playing out. You know, as I look at slide nine, um, at the high school course grade distribution. And, you know, you can see the chronic absenteeism getting worse over the quarters. And then you also see a relation in grades and, you know, the C or higher uh, um, getting less and less. So maybe we haven't had a chance to do that. And I mean, we're taking steps to try and intercede, right? Because it makes sense. Um, how are we measuring the success there? Uh, is it just, you know, because um, like you said, you know, someone may not go to a class and still do really well. I'm guessing that that's an outlier, right? That That's not the normal uh, response that you get. Uh, but I'm curious as to, what more, what other information we have or how to look at it. And that's time, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. If you want to <clears throat> thank you. Um, and thank you for the questions. Very thoughtful. Um, on the surface, if you looked at the Maryland State Attendance Standard of 94%, and I'm going to use my own experiences as a principal, um, when we would look at our overall attendance, we were at or above the attendance standard. And you could just say, well, we're fine, let's move on. But that didn't tell the real story. What, when we looked at disaggregated data within this work, which is where chronic absenteeism you know, comes into play as an important benchmark, what we found was that 74% of our kids were at or above 94%. They were carrying and what we found when we looked closer was that 16% of the kids were below 90% attendance, uh, at or below 90% attendance, and another 10% of those kids um, were in the middle. So we would have different interventions and strategies that we would utilize based on where the individual student was along this journey, knowing that chronic absenteeism is 10% of your total attendance time. So if you're in a building 10 days and you're absent one time, you're chronically absent. If you're building 180, days, that's 18 days or more as being chronically absent. So an illness could make a child chronically absent, and yet they really do have strong attendance. They, they, they were sick. And I think we saw that especially during uh, the pandemic time where we saw shifts in um, you know, historical practices such as having attendance assemblies for perfect attendance or excellent attendance where, you know, now, you know, we don't want to put students in situations where they were sick and they couldn't possibly achieve this. So I think when you're looking at attendance as a factor, it gets down to what Ms. Cortesis and uh, Mr. Wilson were talking about, which is those individualized plans, knowing your students, as Dr. Williams talked about, understanding your data at the school level, being that lead person as a principal, but having a strong team around you to to be able to develop um, plans and strategies and interventions that are consistent with students. Once you mitigate a lot of those variables to the best of your ability, students are available for learning. And then that's where we have to add in that level of engagement, rigor, responsive <laughs> instruction in order to move students forward academically. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Enjoyed your presentation, and I especially um, 
was encouraged by the numbers at the end. So there's qualitative aspects that we're looking for, and there's also those quantitative ones that we're looking for and all those things that we're looking for and so on. Thank you. Um, I did want to um, hear a little bit more about the focus this September on the code of conduct uh, in the schoolhouse. And I especially like your component about family first, pulling in those parents, and also sending home those extra packets. And especially at the elementary level, mm -hmm. right, they're coloring or they're cutting and pasting or they're you know, being creative. Yeah. So it's not homework necessarily, right. but it's, it's fun activities. And then the parents get engaged and they understand more of how their child is learning what they're learning and how they're progressing. Um, but can you speak a little bit more to uh, September focus on the code of conduct and how parents Absolutely. Yeah, I'll start. So um, again, lessons learned from last year. I think we just sort of dove right into the content, at forgetting the relationship piece between teacher and student, student to student. So this year, we really want to take time during those beginning weeks uh, of September to, you know, we're going to, whether you want to call it uh, the, the, the code or the matrix, you know, every school is going to have their own positive behavior plan, which is going to be posted on their school website. So parents will be able to see, all right, so what's happening in terms of behavior intervention strategies that I can look at and really understand? But the students will understand, too. So, you know, what does it mean to, um, to have positive cafeteria rules. So we're going to take kids to the cafeteria and show them how to engage with one another. You know, how do you choose a seat and what do you do during that time? What do positive transitions in the hallways look like? What what's necessary when you're in the hallway? So really taking the time to sh to to show and demonstrate not just at the elementary level, but even at the middle school and high school level. It'll be differentiated, but to still take the time to explicitly teach and model for our students. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear because, um, and it is, we all are very concerned about learning loss, and so we wanted to jump in and dive in. Right. Thank you. Um, she's explicitly reminding me that I have to turn my microphone on. Um, <clears throat> but to um, know that safe and you know, nurturing environments yes. have to be there before you can dive in. Yes. Um, but also going back to how can the families support what's happening? Because we know the teachers have a great workload, the principals, administrators, mm -hmm. school um, nurses, everyone, central office has a heavy workload. And so how can the families and the parents be pulled in to do that? So I was going to add to that, um, I had mentioned earlier about Parent University, and one of the things that we have found um, is most beneficial is when parents learn about the academics and the behaviors and the social emotional learning supports we provide to students during the daytime, and we're in essence teaching the parents those things. So whatever professional development is occurring for the teachers, the parents are in essence getting the same type of thing. We are fortunate this year to have a community school facilitator that is also bridging the partnership between our school and our businesses and families. And so that's another venue that we're using to get parents in and really having conversations. Um, we've also in the past have held principals quarterly um, informal dialogues with me, Principals T, um, just to bridge that gap as well. Um, so we provide opportunities for parents through family engagement activities. Um, we're fortunate we've done it virtually and in person, and we've done it at various times to meet and address the needs of our community. Um, so that has been really helpful, um, and our participation rate has, has gone up from it. So I have more to say, but I'm out of time. No, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments for members? Anyone that still has time? Maybe. No? Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, presentation. <laughs> thank really you. appreciate it. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates, board member comments, and agenda setting. 
First is committee updates, and we'll start with the building and contracts committee. Mr. McMillian, do you have an update since you led the building and contracts committee? I don't have an update on building and contracts, but I have one for audit. Is that okay? Go for it. Uh, the next audit meeting is Tuesday, September 20th, starting at 430. So if you're interested in the audit, please show up for that. And, and I try to be real quick with those, but uh, maybe we'll try to slow them down a little bit too, just to make sure people understand what we're trying to get across there. Thank you. Thank you. Curriculum committee, Mr. Offerman. Yes, the next curriculum committee meeting will be held on Thursday, September 15th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Equity committee, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. The next equity committee meeting will be September 22nd at 4 p.m. And I can give an update. We reviewed Black Boy Joy and Genius, where we spoke about the collaboration across BCPS. We talked about... Um, uh, we took a look at what we have to learn and to transfer black boy joy and genius to more schools in the district, lesson planning, implementation, teacher reflection, uh, data analysis of black male student achievement, and the numbers. We also, as a committee, heard about the number of behavioral incidences that have decreased and how achievement has increased. So we basically got an update about how it's working, what it's doing, and the benefits that it's having at BCPS. We were also able to to get an update on the collective equity professional learning communities at BCPS. And that's a renewed focus and a deep commitment to institutionalizing professional learning communities and equity and action statements aligned with and to the compass, our pathway to excellence. So it was wonderful to hear that. I'd encourage everyone to go listen um, to that. So thank you. Thank you. Legislative and governmental relations, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Legislative and Government uh, Relations Committee, uh, right now the meeting dates are uh, set for February, but I'm going to connect with the committee staff and uh, have that start mm -hmm. sooner. We have uh, work uh, left from last year um, uh, that was started in the fall, and uh, in terms of setting the priorities for the board, the board having a approved, agreed upon set that uh, we can uh, provide to the legislature for their session, but also uh, for other bodies like the county council and the county executive, so they understand what our uh, priorities are for the school system and the support and the resources that we may be asking for. Thank you. And for new board members, the priorities document is something that's um, that the board visits annually and is updated annually. Um, so thank you for that update. Um, policy review, Ms. Rowe. Yes, the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is September 19th at 4.30. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kuhn, did you have any updates from budget? You to uh, share? The next meeting for the budget uh, committee is scheduled for September 21st at 5.30 in the afternoon. Thank you. Next is board member comments and agenda items for future board meetings, and we'll start with Ms. Rowe. So other than welcoming everyone back to the school year very soon and encouraging our teachers and staff to um, persevere in whatever situation you find yourselves in because some people will have more subs in the school than others and to just, you know, try to work together. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll all work together and this will work out. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Good evening. I just want to start out by saying that the start of the school year is a very exciting time. It's a very um, positive time. Everyone's uh, excited. I was really pleased to be able to attend the um, administrative supervisory um, kickoff meeting that was held. Uh, Dr. Williams and um, um, all of the staff here, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Ms. Charlie Green and uh, Dr. Yarborough and uh, so many others involved in putting that together. Um, it was very exciting. And I do just want to express gratitude to each teacher, school support staff uh, person 
the administrators, we know we've heard from um, one exciting, enthused principal, but we know that we have 176 of them. And um, it is about um, everyone working together. Um, and I'm just grateful for everyone that has stepped up to join our system because they have a love for children, because they understand the importance of public education, because they want to do the best that they can for the children that are here, that are in our responsibility to nurture, to help them fulfill their potential. So I'm excited, um, and I also want to say that um, there are um, some things that we need to continue to work on. Um, in some of the data that we received here today, I think it's important, and, and I really appreciate Mrs. San's comment about burnout, because really that's what happened in all of the pandemic. People got burned out from being at home and being worried all the time, and then they came to school, and it was a different kind of stimulation and that they weren't used to, weren't prepared for, um, and that led to a lot of burnout. And I appreciate your comment, too, about the uh, fourth quarter, that's something uh, that many people have talked about is the testing that goes on in the fourth quarter, and then the, I'd never thought about the grades not being reflected. Um, but there is continued work to do, and I look forward to doing my part. Thank you. Ms. Tulowski? Be beautifully said. Um, but yes, we are all here for the children. So as we embark on another school year, um, you know, we are all a small, small part of the puzzle, and I certainly wish everybody patience and and luck and just appreciation for all the little successes each day. Um, the one thing that I think would be great to follow up on because it was brought up at a previous meeting is um, the cell phone policy and how that would be better enforced this year compared to last year. I know that that was something that I brought up and um, I think the meeting was going to be held the next day. So I, um, I think following up on that to make sure that we're doing a better job of helping kids engage in learning a little bit better this year regarding the phones would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And just everybody wishing everybody a really great start to the year. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Uh, I'm excited about the start of the school year, and, and I'm going to throw out dignity and respect. It, it's all about dignity and respect. I don't care whether custodians, classroom teachers, parents, central staff, board members, uh, it, dignity and respect. And, and we've got to we've got to support everybody. Uh, I, when I coached, I, I told the kids all the time, it's not normal. You're not going to like everybody. It, it doesn't work. That's not real. But if a kid's standing underneath the basket and he's open, you pass him the ball so he can score the two points. So we've got to work with each other. We've got to take the, the, the non-essentials off the teachers' plates so that they can concentrate on the classrooms because that's where the learning takes place. It's that relationship with that teacher and those students. And those scores are going to go up if those relationships are healthy and strong and, and they nurture each other. And we've got to nurture them just like they do the students in the classrooms. Uh, on the agenda setting, I want to see something about the alternative schools. They're like out there by themselves someplace. We need to talk about them. We need to bring those people in. We need to show them dignity and respect because they've got an extremely difficult job and they need to know that we support them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Hassan. Thank you, and thank you everyone here on the day as staff are coming in. Teachers, I know they came back to school yesterday, so a huge shout out to our teachers, admin team, to students who are about to enter the building. I know I'm excited to go back to school on Monday. Um, senior year is an interesting interesting thing. Um, but overall, I, I think I just want to take a moment to appreciate you guys and appreciate the work that we're putting in. Um, my favorite my favorite quote ever is the one by John Lewis, the good trouble one. And so I hope this year we can get into some good trouble. And I'm going to keep saying it all the time because it is my favorite thing to say. And it is what we should be living by here on this board. We are putting in the work and it's time that we continue to do that. Um, I'm hoping that we can start talking about mental health more. I know that we are talking about it and talking about burnout, which is great, but I want to make sure that we continue that conversation, continue talking about school climate and things that we can do to make 
students' experiences better and, and hear them and include them right here on the dais. I know that I'm one student, but there are 111,000 that I'm representing, and I just hit this chair. Um, but um, I can't wait to, to bring those voices to the table and hear them first. So thank you all so much. I hope we all have a great school year, a great evening, and see you at the next board meeting, committee meetings, all of the above. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes, I would hope that we would all recognize and appreciate how much extra time staff and especially classroom teachers are putting in right now. The opening of school was a very exciting time, but it's a tremendous amount of work. And uh, I, I know so many teachers and, and staff members go far, far and far beyond what is, what is, what is required of them. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to welcome everyone back to school and hope everyone has a has a good um, a good uh, school year. Um, I would like to also congratulate the summer graduates who I had the pleasure of attending the summer graduation along with Ms. Jones, and I just wanted to congratulate those students for what they did over the summer, completing all of the hard work and everything, and um, participating in the summer graduation. I think that's very important. And also, I wanted. To to um, sort of acknowledge um, Dr. Williams and also, I believe it was, um, you worked with um, Mr. Scrivens or Dr. Scrivens on getting the basketball hoops up. It was an issue that I spoke about when I first came to the board some years ago um, in the 4th District that they weren't up and it was addressed, and now they are all up throughout the county. I've gone and I've driven everywhere, and I've seen them up everywhere. And they were up over the summer, and they're still up. And um, that may sound like something small, but over the summer when there are children who um, maybe couldn't go to camp, I saw them on the basketball courts. And um, I think that was um, something that was very beneficial and important in my community, and I hope in other communities as well. So thank you for that. Dr. Hager? Um, I didn't prepare anything official either, but um, I do also, of course, want to welcome back our teachers and staff who came back yesterday, but I know who have been working most of the summer um, in preparing for this school year. Um, and also thinking about the fall sports athletes who came back a few weeks ago as well, and then the students who go back next week. And so um, my three kids will be in three different schools next year, so I'll get a, a wide range of experiences in different Baltimore County schools next year myself. Um, as far as agenda items, um, again, a broken record about school meals, but I do think there are a lot of uh, a um, lot of misinformation out there, and I think that if we had a uh, presentation so that folks could learn more about what's what the federal government controls versus what we can control at the BCPS level, all the changes that happened during the pandemic, lots of changes are happening this year coming up. People are going to be very surprised when they come back to school, I think. So again, um, some things that we can do around that. And then the two areas that I, I also, uh, from what I understand, we're making a lot of progress in would be um, special education with our new leadership and middle schools, the focus that we're doing on middle schools. I think topics would be great to hear about at a future meeting. Thank you. And I think I've covered everybody, so that leaves me. Um, I, too, want to welcome everyone back to the new school year. This is a special one for me. It's bittersweet, as it's my last year as a BCPS parent. And I am overwhelmed with gratitude for the Team BCPS family. And as I continue to think of Every principal, every, um, well, every administrator, every teacher that not only I've had as a student, but that my ch two children have had going through BCPS um, as my time as a parent comes to a close at the end of this year, I'm just overwhelmed with appreciation for everyone in this system. And while my role as a board member won't end, thankfully, and I get to stay connected, I am so thankful for all of you and everyone that works so incredibly hard on behalf of all our students. And every time I look at Mrs. San and, and think of the, this beautiful senior and think of all of our seniors, um, I get choked up. But anyway, this is a special year, and I'm so thankful. I know it won't be an easy year um, on anyone, and we, as um, everyone has said, you are all working so incredibly hard, and I'm so grateful for all of your efforts. It was wonderful seeing so many um, folks at BCPS Fest. It was wonderful seeing you connect with families and knowing that it is about relationships. It is about 
connecting with families in that personal way and knowing that you're caring for children. That's why we're all here. And I hear from teachers and from administrators how hard it is to make those connections, and we're doing it. You are showing it that it can be done, and that is what makes a difference. So with that, I hope we have a wonderful year. And Mr. Kuhn, Mr. Kuhn, Mr. Kuhn I'm so sorry. And Ms. Jo and Ms. Joseph, you are happen to be on the line. Yes, I'm still here. Well, Mr. Kuhn, um, you're going to have to top that. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm sorry right, well, to have skipped to you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, reiterate what, what a lot of folks have already said. I know that uh, especially seniors have, um, you know, a big year ahead of them uh, as applications um, have opened up. The uh, essay prompts are available on the Common, uh, common App. Uh, for all the colleges and folks are getting busy that way already before school's even started. Uh, so um, uh, just hang in there. It's a process that takes many, many months and it, it won't be immediate and and you'll all get through it. Uh, so, um, you know, special shout out to the seniors. I know it's a big process and all the kids that are excited to go and all the parents that are excited for them to go back to school. Thank you. Anyone else? Last call. <laughs> Ms. Joes? Oh, no. Okay. okay. I think we got everybody. Any other business board members for the evening? Okay. The last item on the agenda then is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, September 13th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.